We apologize for this morning's technical difficulty. Uh, just wanted to make sure everyone was awake and really ready to get going. I am going to start again with this welcome. So welcome once more to Wednesday morning, day three of the Meet Summit Sessions 2021. And it's my pleasure to once again introduce our two on this microgrid session led by Jared and Maria Belen. Thank you both. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Maria Belen. Good morning. How are you? I'm really looking forward to talking with you today and, and um, getting to chew on microgrids. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Maria Belen and I uh, will be your hosts and speakers today. Um, and uh, this is a topic that's uh, near and dear to our hearts. So we're glad that you are starting your day off uh, getting to learn a little bit about microgrids. Um, I'm the senior manager of industry strategy at SEPA. I'll go in a little bit more about that. But like I said, I'm really excited to talk to you, Maria Belen. Um, can you share to the audience uh, who you are and uh, a little bit about what you do? Sure. Thanks, Jared. My name is Maria Belen Power. I am the Associate Executive Director of Green Roots, and we are an environmental justice organization in Chelsea and East Boston. Great. We're going to hear a lot more from Maria Belen uh, on some of the work that she's doing. Uh, in East Boston. Um, but I wanted to start off with a really brief, uh, brief, brief story just to kind of set the, the tone a little bit about, about microgrids and what they are and really uh, how they entered into my own personal journey and how they might be entering into yours. Um, we all might have a very similar story. Um, so in September 2017, Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, uh, and that was really the impetus of my personal journey with microgrids and a lot of what SEPA uh, has done. Um, the organization I work with, SEPA, is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to facilitate this transition to clean and modern and resilient through a whole host of different things. Um, and after Hurricane Maria, we took on an initiative along some great organizations to look for ways to build back the Puerto Rican electric uh, grid uh, more resilient, uh, stronger, flexible more than before. Um, so as you may know, this legacy grid has you know, large transmission lines and it mirrors a lot of what we see across the US and the Northeast. Um, and uh, when storms come through and natural, natural hazards and big winds and, and storms, um, these lines can be destroyed. And microgrids are something that it can be one solution. So I think a lot of where this story starts for a lot of us are um, we, you know, there are vulnerable areas, whether that's vulnerable populations. And I know Maria Belen, you're going to be talking a little bit about some of the communities that you're working with. Um, that also means, you know, vulnerable infrastructure and microgrids um, are a way, uh, for me, the way I see it, are uh, more malleable and more resilient. And they're one tool in the energy resilience toolbox. So really, what does that mean? Um, we recently sat down with a bunch of different utilities and industry stakeholders. We asked them, what are, throw out a couple words. Um, and I encourage you to do this at, at home in the audience. You know, when you think of microgrids, what do you think of? Uh, and Marie Belen, I want to ask you that at first when I when you start your your story a little bit. But you know, things people said: island, larger, dispatchability, self-sustaining. Um, let's see, I'm looking at this: local load, backup, uh, autonomous, independent, uh, interconnection, customers, different, isolated. You know, so a lot of different things kind of come to mind. Uh, the Oxford Dic Dictionary um, defines it as a small network of electricity users with a local source of supply that is usually attached to a centralized national grid, but is able to function independently. I kind of like that one. Um, they have it, uh, you know, use it in a sentence. This microgrid delivers power to homes, a school, a church, a health center, three general stores, and streetlights. To me, that one really stood out because it's talking about where they serve. And I, and I think that's really important. Uh, the DOE has a definition. I encourage you to, to look it up. Um, it's very similar. We're talking really about um, loads, local generation, and this ability to island from the grid. So next you might be asking, when and where are microgrids most suitable? Um, I'll give you a quick perspective from SEPA all across the country, Maria Belen, um, you'll hear in a moment. 
uh, to give a perspective, you know, local to um, Boston and the and the neighboring areas. Um, but really, when the, the you know the the question is, you know, who you it depends on who you ask and where you ask. Uh, but the main criteria that often are tied to microgrids are resiliency. So where are the risks, hazards, and threats to the system? Where are there outages happening? Um, where are the most critical infrastructure? Remember the Oxford Dictionary, you know, the homes, the churches, uh, the police stations, the community centers, um, areas that experience energy, energy burden uh, or uh, low income or LMI communities, um, population density, um, you know, where do we put, you know, grids that can serve electricity? Well, you look at where people are and where the loads are um, in geography. Um, and this is really interesting. You know, in Puerto Rico, you have remote communities. A lot of times microgrids, micro, you know, smaller grids are, are more um, viable or feasible in, in more remote communities, which uh, otherwise you'd have to build all this electrical infrastructure. So with that, um, you know, their microgrids do mean many things. Uh, they're not synonymous with, with renewable. There can be any types of fuel sources. Um, and they're not necessarily only backup generators. They can, there are more than just backup generators. They can be clean. They're smarter. They're able to communicate with the grid seamlessly uh, and they have more take capabilities. Um, so with that, um, I hope that helps kind of lay some of the groundwork, Maria Belen, uh, for what you have to talk about and uh, as we kind of chew on this topic. Um, but I know what everyone's kind of, you know, here wants to hear about is like, how are these types of projects, what do they actually look like in the community? I just talked a lot about what they are uh, and what they aren't. Um, so what do they mean to you? Sure. Thanks, Jared. So I think for us, it's important to understand the context of our communities, like you said, vulnerable communities. Um, and Chelsea and East Boston are two definitions, epitomes of what does it mean to be an environmental justice community. Um, so Chelsea, the vast majority are people of color, over 60% identify as um, a racial or ethnic minority, um, the majority of which are Latino and Latina like myself who came here from Nicaragua. Um, about a quarter of the population lives below the poverty level. And, um, and there are over 35 languages spoken in Chelsea. And in East Boston, very similar, um, majority Latino um, and Latina. And in, che in, in Chelsea, there are over 40,000 residents living in 1.8 square miles. So one of the most densely populated cities um, in the Commonwealth. And in East Boston, there are over 50,000 residents living in five square miles, even though three of those are occupied by Logan International Airport. And both of our communities together, we are home to 100% of the jet fuel that's used at Logan International Airport. We are also home to 70 to 80% of the region's home heating fuel. We are also home to over 400,000 tons of road salt that are used in over 350 communities. And we are also home to one of the largest produce distribution centers in the country, serving the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic states, and Southern Canadian provinces. So when there is a climate disaster or an environmental disaster, there will be serious consequences for our community and also for this critical infrastructure, some of them I just mentioned. Um, you know, the story that you shared about Puerto Rico is very similar to our story. Chelsea has a large Puerto Rican diaspora. And so when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, a lot of our folks in Chelsea were directly impacted themselves, their families, their loved ones. And they experience what it means to lose power for prolonged periods of time. And from that experience, I remember we had a community meeting where doing a microgrid or doing the feasibility study for a microgrid came at the very top of the community's priorities. And I thought, no way, this is way too wonky, way too technical. Why is the community so excited about this? And it was right about the time that Hurricane Maria had hit. It was actually um, a couple months later. And it really was clear 
that Chelsea would be just as impacted, if not worse, if we were hit by a Hurricane Maria, because we know that we're not going to be the first community with the power back on after a huge power outage. You know, Chinatown in New York City after Superstorm Sandy was one of the last communities to get power back on in New York City. And so, so Marie yes, Milan, go for it. These 50,000 these 50, people in your community, uh, lots of critical infrastructure. The, reli the, the reliance on power is key. This, this, happen this, this event happens down in Puerto Rico which makes up a lot of your community. If you were to go, if you were to ask the people in your community, why microgrids, what are microgrids, you know, is there your people, you know, grasping the idea, like what would they say? Yeah, I think what we talk about is resilient energy, power that we can um, keep on. We talk about local sources of energy, you know, talking about microgrids can get really wonky, but what we know is that it will be resilient, it will be local, it can be renewable, and we will work towards a renewable microgrid. And just ensuring that people have power. You know, I, I just read a piece around um, Hurricane Ida, and a lot of people died because of loss of power and extreme heat. So in the middle of the summer, when we have extreme heat and we lose power for prolonged periods of time, Chelsea is an urban heat island. And so there will be serious consequences for life and death for our residents. So a microgrid is really one tool in the toolbox of solutions in our work towards climate resiliency. Toolbox, I, I, I always use that, I like that a lot, Maria Belen. So what are, you, what are you currently up to? What's the latest uh, project kind of going on in your area? Yeah, so you know the feasibility study we did it. It ended. It um, it took us a few years, and now we're implementing it little by little. And so Green Roots is anchoring the work in Chelsea, and our partners in Chinatown is the Chinatown Community Land Trust. So we're looking at two different models in Chelsea. We're looking at a publicly owned municipal microgrid where the the decisions are in the hands of the public where people are appointed um and are accountable to the residents um where the the main buildings that we are looking at are like you said critical infrastructure that were prioritized by the community so city hall police department fire um and now we're looking at some affordable housing uh buildings that will eventually will expand to hopefully cover the whole city if we can, because Chelsea is so small, it's 1.8 square miles, but really those critical infrastructures are all over the city, the schools, the libraries, um, police, fire, city hall, those are sort of the buildings that we see as the priority in beginning to implement. So we're starting to implement, um, to install battery storage, to um, acquire some solar panels and to really start producing our own power. And like you said, connect it to the grid and during a, a, gray, a gray sky scenario, be able to disconnect, be able to unplug and, and keep our city powered on. You know, that just reminded me of uh, a project someone told me about in Chicago, um, the Bronzeville uh, <laughs> community microgrid. Um, so if you're curious to learn more about what that publicly owned municipality microgrid, um, definitely check out the Bronzeville uh, microgrid in Chicago. Um, and Maria Belen, is there anything, on, you know, online resources that, go, you know, to go through the feasibility study or information for people to find out more about that project? Absolutely, they are online. Um, we, the coalition that we are part of that we work with is called Run GJC. So it's Run Resilient Urban Neighborhoods. It's our technical partners. And GJC is a green justice coalition. And it's a coalition of grassroots, um, environmental and environmental justice communities. And so if you look up Run GJC, Feasibility Study Microgrid, you will find both of those for Chelsea and Chinatown. You know, Great. one thing that I guess I'll add is we, we're not... Um, we're not looking to a microgrid that does not democratize energy and that does not break out the, um, the monopoly, but really be able to, uh, to bring the power back, the power literal and, and metaphorically back to, to the residents because it's, 
we can um, electrify everything, we can reduce emissions all, all around, but if we don't shift the power dynamic of those who have and those who don't, of the most vulnerable versus the very privileged, we're not really achieving environmental justice. I wanna focus in on um, two things, because um, kind of to carry through giving power to the people and environmental justice, um, but let's not, you know, ignore how we work with the utility because they are the current operators of the grid and oftentimes are going to be the ones that are there where this microgrid actually connects. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, when I think of microgrids, I think of the microgrid servicing this community or everyone that is a customer of the microgrid. Um, and I also think of the microgrid as servicing the grid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, while events are happening more rapidly and more increased scale, they're still um, rare. And, and uh, these emergency events where the microgrid serves the community um, oftentimes is not in the majority, meaning, you know, most of the time, that that project can be utilized for the grid and, and benefit everybody, not just those who are being served by the microgrid. Um, and in my experience, that that is the key that I've seen really push microgrid projects um, into the green, really in terms of cost effectiveness, um, being able to harness this power and these resources for the grid. Um, there's a question that came in from the audience that's asking about non-wires alternatives. Marie Blen, are you familiar with that terminology? Is, is that something else we should demystify today? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it does need to be demystified, but I am familiar. We are connecting our um, our critical infrastructure and and the the infrastructure that we're installing uh, behind behind the meter, and so it is a non-wires alternative. We have a lot of barriers in Massachusetts as to crossing public ways, as to connecting different buildings to each other. And so that is one of the solutions that we're utilizing is the non-wires alternative and connecting these critical infrastructures through the cloud. So I, I think that's sort of the future and the present of how are we going to um, ensure that these buildings are connected um, long-term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And, and is there plans for more projects? And, and I, I'll ask you because I think a lot of there, I'm seeing a, a few questions from the audience kind of talking about what are challenges, but, but what are you what's successful? Um, so are there a few things that you'd like to share um, that have been successful, uh, and that you bring to your new projects and as you continue on your journey? Sure, I think that what is the most successful is prioritizing the most vulnerable voices. And so if somebody came to Chelsea and said, we're gonna do a microgrid, we're gonna helicopter in, we're gonna connect these buildings and, and you're gonna have resiliency, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because it's not led by the community because people won't know about it because you're gonna have a hard time um, getting people bought in. And it's really through the grassroots um, organizations. It's really through the residents, the most impacted residents that you're going to be able to provide these solutions that work in the best way possible. The solutions have to come from the ground up. And mm -hmm. I'll share one of the things that we are also doing is we're also fighting archaic infrastructure that is being proposed in our community. And, and we are proud to say that we are fighting the bad and also building the new. And so we are fighting this uh, East Boston substation proposed by Eversource that is um, being located next to 8 million gallons of jet fuel next to a playground in a parcel of land that has flooded before in an environmental justice community. At the same time, we're working with Eversource on this microgrid in Chelsea. And so we know that the solution is there, but we just cannot be um, building more archaic infrastructure in the communities that are the most vulnerable, that have been the most excluded, and that are really bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. 
our communities have contributed the least to climate emissions, and yet we are being hit the worst by the climate crisis. So I really think that the solutions have to come from the ground up, and we have to prioritize the communities most impacted. Well, it's a powerful story that you share. Thank you for sharing it. Um, I'll I'll leave everybody with this. I, I think there's clearly there's a lot of challenges, but working together, collaborating uh, with all the, the different communities um, is just so critical. I mean, microgrids in essence is from the ground up. They're smaller scale. It starts at the micro level and it can get to the macro level. Um, so. Thank you, Marie Belen, for sharing a little bit of a local perspective. Um, thank you to the audience for your questions and, and uh, bearing with the technical difficulties this morning. Um, I'm really glad that we were able to do this. Uh, and, and thanks for extending it 10 more minutes so we were able to have this conversation. But um, thank you all. Appreciate it. Hey, good morning, folks. Uh, that was a great session, wasn't it, Derek? Microgrids. It was. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to uh, be here with you this morning after the technical glitches have been cleared. We don't often get to uh, to appear on screen together or, or uh, work that closely in the office, so this is great to, to be with you. Um, uh, so do you want to... Uh, kick off thanking our sponsors. Yes, thank you everyone and good morning. Uh, uh, as Darren is from NEEP, I am as well. My name is Derek Conduction. I'm an associate at NEEP. Um, just wanted to give a big thanks to everyone for being here this morning. Uh, I'm not surprised that we had at least one little Zoom blip in our in our session, but I, I do appreciate everyone being, being patient um, uh, with us. Um, so we're looking for a great day today for our last day of the summit. Um, just want to give another quick plug to our great sponsors that uh, have allowed us to to be here today and uh, hold hold this session. And um, those are our gold sponsors, the uh, Bar Foundation, NYSERDA, our partners in in Connecticut, um, CT Deep, UI, and Eversource, our partners in Rhode Island, the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources, National Grid, and the Rhode Island Energy Efficiency and Resource Management Council. Um, we'd also like to thank Mitsubishi Electric, E for the Future, Daikin, and, and Solutions for Energy Efficient Logistics, or SEAL. And lastly, we'd like to thank our uh, Supporting sponsor C Power. So, hand it back over to you, Darren, um, on a little housekeeping as we get into our first first session of our final day. Great. Uh, thanks, Darren. So, uh, I'm Darren Port, Senior Manager, Cozen Standards at NEEP. I've uh, been with NEEP for almost eight years now, and uh, glad to be with you all this morning, and uh, particularly. A uh, big shout out and thanks to all our, our sponsors, our supporting sponsors and, and gold sponsors. Uh, so just a bit of housekeeping this morning uh, in our ongoing efforts to uh, improve accessibility. Uh, there is closed captioning available for all of the sessions. You have the option to enable that or, or uh, not enable that as needed. Uh, you can submit your uh, questions throughout the sessions in the uh, Q&A uh, uh, box there. So we definitely encourage your, your questions. Uh, and in order to uh, to maximize everyone's time, uh, you know, please uh, put your your comments and uh, in, in, in the uh, chat, and we'll be able to uh, review that and let the presenters know and the session uh, moderators know uh, your comments as well as your questions. Uh, so we have an exciting uh, morning ahead. Uh, and we're uh, very excited to have Erin uh, with us, uh, and she'll be uh, kicking off the next session. 
Uh, good morning, Aaron. How are you? Hello, Aaron. Morning, Darren and Derek. I'm doing doing well. How are you? Yeah, we're we're good. good. Yeah, yeah, we've overcome the uh, technical hurdles this morning, and and here we all are. I know, right? As Derek said, was bound to happen at some point in time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no yeah. Doubt. So yeah. yeah. So. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Erin Cosgrove, and I am the public policy manager here at NEEP. Um, and so I'm excited to join Derek and Darren here for the last couple of minutes. I did, um, and um, I guess I'll go ahead and just introduce our next panel. Um, so everyone just to give you a little background, uh, my job at NEEP kind of uh, intersects all the program work and then all of the states and communities that we work on. So I get to watch regulatory processes and government planning processes, and then I can let them know about all the really great ways that energy efficiency can help them achieve climate goals. Um, and by doing this work, I get to highlight all of the wonderful things that we do at NEEP. But I'm really excited to introduce our panel this morning Well, I will be talking to other, um, other individuals from different organizations who kind of work in the same space. And we're going to talk about how energy efficiency programs, something that we're all very passionate about, can help states achieve um, shifting goals around both climate and equity. Um, and um, so our session will highlight the ways that energy efficiency programs are shifting to support grid management, climate, and equity goals, and also examine key necessary changes to identify roles for both program administrators and policymakers in this space. And with that, I believe I'm going to invite the panelists on to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. Um, and why don't we just go ahead and we can start introductions with Jen. And if you could just do a short intro where you work and then a line or two about how you're interested in this topic. Yes, uh, good morning. This is Jen Meisner. I am Director of Performance Management at NYSERDA. And in that role, um, myself and my team are, are very much involved in, um, you know, helping to uh, plan programs and strategies, you know, to, to meet these new goals and then all the way through to helping to evaluate how well we're doing um, and track those metrics uh, to, toward the, the ultimate policy goals. So very happy to be here today and uh, discuss this topic. Great, thank you so much, Jen. Um, next, I will toss it over to Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm Rachel Gold from ACEEE. I'm the Utilities Program Director there. Um, and our team works with electric and natural gas utilities around the country to accelerate their use of energy efficiency to support their customers, to support planning, um, and to support decarbonization. So um, I'm really excited about this conversation. We've been focusing a lot in our work on what we're calling climate forward efficiency, which I'll share more about later, or really this idea that energy efficiency in order to maximize its value as a decarbonization resource is going to need to evolve how we design policy for it, how we structure programs, how we structure rate making in order to make sure we're maximizing its value as an equitable decarbonization resource. So excited to chat about this topic today. Great. Thank you so much for highlighting all of that, Rachel. And next, I will pass it to Nathan to round us out. Thank you, Erin. Uh, pleasure to be here today. Uh, Nathan Phelps with the Vote Solar. I'm regulatory director working primarily in the Northeast. So we do a lot of things, but first and foremost, I'll, I'll note for this panel that we're really working towards uh, the, the clean energy future of the future, uh, which is really going to need a lot of distributed energy resources and obviously, obviously energy efficiency is going to be paramount in that DER future. So happy to be here and I uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and so before I get started, I'll just remind everyone to please put any questions that you have for our panel into the chat. Um, and I will put them in as we continue through our discussion. Um, and so to start off this conversation, you know, we're talking about energy efficiency and how it can change to meet goals. I'd really like to start with Rachel to talk about kind of where energy efficiency started and how it's going to change or how we see it changing in the future. 
Thanks, Aaron. So energy efficiency, particularly in the Northeast, has a really rich history of serving as a least cost resource and serving as a tool to support bill affordability for customers and system uh, least cost system affordability for, for everyone, um, for all ratepayers. Uh, and things like environmental protection, equity, and economic development have always been on the menu for efficiency, but they've really been secondary objectives, particularly in terms of the legislation or the authorizing um, statutes or regulations that encourage energy efficiency. And we're increasingly seeing with concerns about climate change, with cost declines for renewables and storage that are changing grid dynamics, with continued inequity, particularly the recent recession with the pandemic, just a, a real switch in what we're expecting out of energy efficiency. We're also seeing those changes in terms of what we're expecting out of utilities in general, but, but we're seeing this really acutely in energy efficiency. And as a result, there's really a disconnect between the way that we structure programs now, which has really led to great success, right? Kilowatt hours and therm savings have been on the rise for a long time. We have a great history of delivering those through utility energy efficiency programs. And we're gonna need to evolve those now to make sure that we're focusing on those values that used to be sort of in the background and are really coming to the forefront around climate equity and economic development. Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, Jen, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of pass it to you to see, because you work with metrics and EM and V and maybe how you see that changing as we um, sort of shift energy efficiency as Rachel was discussing. Right. Well, I definitely see these very, very ambitious uh, climate goals and other goals um, that we're trying to achieve. I'm sure we'll get into discussing a bit of the uh, the New York Climate Act um, during this time here today. But um, really, I think that the energy efficiency programs of the past, you know, many of them have been about customer acceptance and takers, you know, and have served um, maybe a more limited um, number of customers or portion of the market. And we need to move significantly beyond that um, in order to um, meet our very ambitious goals. Um, we need to have a massive scale up um, and market transformation in order to get there. Um, you know, we've been talking about this. This looks like moving from serving maybe 20,000 buildings a year to serving 200,000 buildings a year for the next many years or decade. Um, and we need to think about different program models, um, like pay for performance model, like program models that, um, you know, can, um, you know, can involve larger portfolios of projects and proliferate um, those energy efficiency benefits um, in a much broader way. Um, and I think we even need to look to how can programs like codes and standards support for, you know, stretch codes support for better code compliance. How can that sort of raise up, you know, the the whole um, stock? So really, it's um, you know, when I see these these numbers, these big goals, you know, that we need to achieve, um, I think about the massive scale up and the change in the nature of these programs that we really need to to get there. And, um, you know, NYSERDA has been in the market transformation business for quite some time now, but it's really even, you know, amped up a level, I think, is what we're talking about today. Yes, thank you so much for that overview, Jen, and so many different topics for us to go down that you brought up. Um, I guess for now, I actually kind of want to talk about uh, more, more uh, the disconnect that we're seeing probably in the focus on the policy and the regulatory space. And Nathan, I'd like to kind of toss it to you because I actually was first introduced to you through um, a performance incentive mechanisms regulatory process and your involvement in that. And I really appreciate how you... <clears throat> excuse me, how you come from solar to talk about energy efficiency. And so I'd like to kind of, if you don't mind giving an overview of kind of where you see some of the disconnect in how energy efficiency is regulated first. And then Jen and Rachel, I'll probably ask you to, to add anything after this. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so first I'll, I'll note to lay a little bit more foundation with what Jen and Rachel were just talking about that we have never ever had an equitable energy system, in all honesty. We've never had an equal uh, uh, distribution of the cost and the benefits of the system. So some communities have 
uh, as we heard in the, the previous conversation, some communities have borne a disproportionate amount of the negative impacts of the energy system. And that, in my mind, should be one of the paramount, if not the, the most important consideration when we're talking about how we think about and structure the, the regulatory system going forward of the energy system. And energy efficiency plays uh, like an integral role in that. So when we think about the, the traditional energy system, utilities are financially motivated to build infrastructure. So they make more money, they get a return on their investment when they build stuff. And that actually really isn't the best model going forward. I, I don't think anyone would actually start with that premise if we were had a blank slate. So the idea is now, like, how do we actually change things? How do we actually change the, the financial incentives for the electric utilities and the gas utilities? so that we can actually have a system that is A, more equitable, and then B, uh, actually more economically efficient. So that, that's kind of the premise. And ultimately that requires a lot of changes in all honesty, more than anything in the mindset. So the mindset of utilities, the mindset of regulators and in the mindset of consumers too. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview, Nathan. And that really does kind of get at the heart of the heart of what we're all kind of talking about, which is how utilities are motivated and how we can change that motivation um, a little bit. So, um, Rachel, I, I saw you taking some notes, and I was wondering if you had anything else that you'd like to add. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm always taking notes, but um, in, in, especially when Nathan's talking. I know. Um, but in this case, uh, maybe I'll just add that um, I think Nathan gave a great overview of overall some of the disconnects in the system that we see at the macro or the structural level. I'll also note that that translates down into the the micro of energy efficiency policy as well. And so, um, you know, one thing we've been thinking about at ACEE is, well, what, what does energy efficiency need to look like in order to meet these really ambitious goals that Jen spoke about? And for us, there's maybe three really big components that, that kind of need to be unlocked. Of course, there's the scaling piece, right? We need to make sure that the, the magnitude of our ambition for energy efficiency is matching the policy goals that we have where utilities have corporate goals that we're matching that. Um, we need to make sure that we're prioritizing those energy efficiency investments that best deliver greenhouse gas reduction. So increasingly, we need to start thinking about time, seasonal, and geographic impacts. Jen mentioned pay for performance programs. That's one tool that can help us unlock the data and the performance associated with that. So that's a really important piece. And then I think the third is we really need to be able to better prioritize what we're investing in across fuels, across systems, and across sectors. And if we can do that, and it's a really tall order to do it, we're going to be able to better unlock the broader universe of energy efficiency. So energy efficiency from fuel switching, from electrification, energy efficiency from really deep retrofits, which in many cases programs tend not to do a ton of because they're expensive um, and, and can be hard to do, um, and from demand flexibility. So making sure that, that we're valuing energy efficiency for what it does on the grid when it does it on the grid. So I think those are maybe three components of well, what do we mean by performance? Um, if we want to have sort of performance-based regulation, those are some of the elements that we're starting to look to when we think about how do we need to redesign energy efficiency specifically. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and now actually, I kind of would like to toss it back to Jen to kind of drill down a little bit more in um, changes that you'd like to see maybe more at the program level and the EM and V level. Um, when we talk about pay for performance um, and we talk about using real-time data, that's not built into the process right now. So what are some changes that you think um, could happen to enable that to be used during energy efficiency programs? Right. Well, I think we, you know, we are getting there with um, setting up um, more programs like that that enable us to use real time data. Um, you know, NYSERDA is piloting um, a pay for performance model um, in New York State with some utility partners. And, um, you know, we're also undertaking some other um, programs that get at, um, you know, more advanced energy management. 
um, and building operations and maintenance. So using, um, you know, data, you know, on building energy use, um, you know, over time to better um, manage that building load and to make um, smart decisions when capital improvements are needed um, to, you know, to kind of get the most efficient options there. Um, in all those cases, of course, um, we as evaluators love to have that data um, available to us from, um, you know, the utility grade, you know, meter data um, from pay for performance. We, we um, you know, uh, just we always try to use that data. Um, and, and I think that it is, um, you know, really great to, um, you know, to, to be able to have that type of information to definitively kind of point to those impacts, um, you know, and, and point to how they're contributing toward these larger goals. But, you know, I will say too, that like to the comments earlier about market transformation and achieving scale, not all the programs and the program models that we will undertake will have data like that. And so we are needing to employ, um, you know, some different approaches um, that, you know, try to look at changes in market adoption over time. And how does that translate into, you know, energy impact in terms of real, you know, energy efficiency results? Um, so you can imagine trying to understand how a training activity to promote um, better code compliance, <laughs> you know, translates into ultimately, uh, you know, how much of the building stock is that affecting in a given year? And then, you know, what does that mean in terms of energy reduction? So we, we have sort of, uh, you know, both ends of the spectrum, I suppose, here in terms of some programs that have some very robust um, data that we that we love to have and, and some programs that are um, using some more novel and some more challenging approaches, frankly, to evaluate market transformation and to place some quantification, um, you know, on those achievements, um, you know, because really we're expecting an awful lot um, from energy efficiency. So, um, you know, the, the, that, that plugs directly into our state climate goals in terms of, you know, 22 million tons of carbon reduction expected from energy efficiency and electrification, you know, um, so that that EM and V, you know, is is quite important in terms of making that linkage. Yes, thank you so much, Den. And you actually, um, you touched on both how important the data is and how important it might be to do things that don't necessarily use data and think a little innovative and outside the box, which sort of cues up what I wanted to discuss next, which is while we're transitioning energy efficiency and um, trying to achieve an equitable and also uh, an equitable grid and one that is also um, climate resilient, um, we also need to think about how we can embed equities and equity needs into this process and also workforce. I think they're both, I wouldn't say that they're on the same level, but I think both of these are kind of amorphous, difficult to measure policies that um, investment and time are kind of needed in as we continue this transition. And so I kind of would like to open it up to the uh, to the group to kind of discuss ways that we, I guess we, we can start with equity. Um, maybe Nathan, I'll start with you because you brought it up so well earlier. Um, ways that we see uh, policies changing to make sure that this grid and this transition is more equitable and what we would like to see in this kind of regulatory space that we're in. Thanks, Erin. Uh, you know, I'll note, building on Jen's point that she just made, data is so critical to so many of the decisions that are made in the energy sector, because if you look at it from a very high perspective, there's one thing that scares people in the energy sector more than anything, and that's like risk and fear of the unknown. No one wants the power to go out. And I think that that really permeates everything that happens in the energy sector. And that fear of the unknown really kind of cripples some people, uh, especially, to be honest, regulators and utilities, about implementing something that they don't know enough about. And that creates some serious problems in regard to equity because so much of the information we have on equity, like 
isn't necessarily centered on historical metrics in the energy sector. So if we think about energy burden, you know, it's energy burden is pretty easy to think about, you know, the percentage of a person's income that they spend on energy. That's the energy burden. We know that energy burden is higher for low wealth families. They can spend upwards of, you know, six, nine or more percent of their total income on energy, whereas higher income households can spend, you know, just a percent or two on, on energy. And so just from that perspective, we know that there's an issue here, but we don't actually manage our energy burden very well on a state-by-state -state basis or even go down to a community or community basis, let alone a household basis. So that is an example of how we, we know that there's an issue we don't actually have data that a, a lot of people, I would say, I'm speculating here, but I don't, I don't think we have data that a lot of people would be comfortable proceeding with change on. Thank you so much for that um, insight, Nathan. Um, and actually building kind of off how we see this changing, Rachel, I'd like to pass it to you to see if you've done any work at ACEEE around um, ways that we can frame equity in the space of energy efficiency programs and think about ways to get the data or maybe not use the data. Yeah. Um, thanks, Aaron. Well, I, I will reiterate um, a lot of what Nathan said, which is that the data is crucial here in order to make good decisions. Um, and that some of it's gonna be really challenging to collect and for good reasons, right? There are real barriers to collecting, for example, household level data. Um, we've been working uh, over the course of the last year on what we're calling our Leading with Equity Initiative. We've heard a lot of feedback, including particularly from folks in the Northeast that our scorecards, which if you haven't seen them, please go to ACEEE.org and check out our scorecards. We rank states, cities, utilities, um, on their energy efficiency efforts. And we've heard from folks, um, as I said, particularly in the Northeast, that there are states or cities that are doing a great job on our scorecards that maybe aren't showing up or doing as, as well as they need to on the equity side. And so we've made a commitment as an organization that, that we wanna flip that narrative and make sure that when we're ranking a state, um, that those that are, are doing a good job on equity are the ones who are coming to the top and that the reverse can't be true. That's gonna take time. It'll probably happen over a few editions, but to start that process, we've been having conversations with community-based organizations, advocates and, and utilities themselves to try and figure out what are the metrics that we should be including? Those may or may not be all of the metrics that, for example, regulators need to pay attention to, but in the context of our scorecards, what should we be tracking? And I'll just flag that there's kind of three big categories that, that come up. One are, of course, the outcomes themselves. So what are we seeing in terms of, for example, energy burden for customers or, for example, um, workforce impacts for customers? That's a place where there are workforce metrics that relate to equity, right? The diversity of your workforce, for example. Um, the second category is really around um, procedural equity. So making sure that everyone is able to have a voice in the process and not just a voice, but increasingly ownership over decision-making within the process. Um, and then the third category is taking all of that and embedding it in the structure. So to our earlier conversation about performance and performance-based regulation, making sure that utilities, states, cities are actually held, held accountable for all of this, that there's a real accountability mechanism to make sure that okay, if we've decided that energy burden is important, is that going to be a part of someone's job? Is that going to be something that, that we're held accountable to? Um, and so we're thinking about metrics in those three big categories. This builds on a lot of work from others, um, Sustainability Directors Network and others who have, who have put together some of these categories. Um, so th those are some of the ways that we're thinking about what we need to collect around equity data. Thank you uh, so much, Rachel. And you brought up a lot of um, great key points that um, we can collect data, but it's also very great to have um, accountability and goals and statewide statewide legislation, maybe, so to say. Um, and so kind of touching on that, Jen, I'd like to toss it to you to kind of talk about um, what's happened since New York passed their um, climate legislation that included um, the mandate to put, I believe it 
was 40% of the benefits to overburdened communities, also has some workforce legislate, um, workforce policy in it, I believe, um, and just kind of how that has changed your work at NYSERDA and um, your organization's goals, I guess. Right, yes. So it is um, the, the Climate Act that, that um, um, was enacted and um, uh, uh, became, I guess, uh, came into place in, in uh, early 2020, January 1st, 2020, um, does speak to at least 35% of the benefits of spending going to disadvantaged communities, but with a goal really of 40%. So you're, you're right there. Um, there is a 40% goal. And um, at this point in time, there is an interim definition, um, which involves um, some specific uh, geographic areas of the state um, that are represented as disadvantaged communities, but that interim definition um, is expected to evolve um, and be finalized um, soon. However, you know, in the, in the interim, um, you know, at, at, at NYSERDA for our major um, clean energy fund portfolio, we're really leaning into um, these uh, goals in a, in a big way. Um, we just had a, a review of the clean energy fund um, done by the Public Service Commission. There are regular reviews during this 10-year timeline of our investments. And um, in our petition and in our proposal um, for the, the go forward, you know, in investments in the clean energy fund, we, um, we obviously are leaning into affirming that goal of uh, reaching 40% of the benefits of spending going to disadvantaged communities across our portfolios. Um, this includes in, you know, a, a big part um, is including investing in low and moderate income, um, you know, needs, um, in particular, you know, low and moderate income homes and, and housing. Um, but it also includes a number of other initiatives, such as uh, clean green schools, um, you know, so funding uh, P to 12 schools to reduce school energy use and um, to convert to carbon free fuels. Um, it includes definitely, as you mentioned, um, community based workforce development. Um, so community based training partnerships um, and on the job training as well for priority populations. And so, you know, um, to, to get to those metrics, we really, um, you know, we, we will be tracking um, not only, you know, how many workers are we training through our programs in total, but how many workers um, from among priority populations are we training? And then also, um, you know, in our broader look at the um, New York State economy and um, clean energy jobs, we will be looking at what is the, you know, the composition of those jobs as well in the state. Um, so, uh, you know, really looking to train and place new entrants in particular um, into some of these fields that we really need to scale, you know, <laughs> speaking to how all these goals are related, right? Um, we, um, you know, we need to place new entrants into um, HVAC and building electrification, right, in order to reach the scale that we need to meet our, our carbon goals um, and to meet our, our clean energy goals more broadly. So. Um, we're kind of, uh, you know, meshing these efforts together um, where, wherever we are able to, to do that. Um, financing for affordable housing um, through the New York Green Bank and, and a whole, you know, a whole uh, uh, list of, of many, many other things, um, I think, that, that are coming into play in terms of the evolution of our major portfolio and addressing um, these, these policy goals. Great, thank you so much for that insight, Jen. Um, I think kind of something that was also brought up when we're talking about these different changes is that there's different kind of key players um, in making this transition. We have utilities, there's also um, regulators, but then there's also state legislators and governors that create policies such as the New York um, law that we were just talking about. Um, and I kind of would like to discuss um, sort of who we think is best to make these changes or where we think these advances could best be coming from. And for the sake of, of 
adding to this conversation, I want to see if either I want to say Rachel or Nathan could speak to efforts in California, um, where I believe we've kind of seen the regulatory agency make some changes without legislation. And then on the opposite coast, we have Massachusetts, where we saw the legislator um, recently enact a law to make some changes. Um, and so actually, I think I want to start with California because I'm a little jazzed about what they did there. So Rachel, um, if you don't mind giving a little background about what, what happened in California at the regulatory agency level. Sure, Erin. As a person who lived in California for a few years, I'm always happy to chat about that great state. Um, I, uh, I guess I'll just start by saying that you know, as many, many of you know, California has a really long record of history of success in energy efficiency, but um, recently their goal setting has been pretty lackluster. So for example, in 2019, the goals were half of what they were in 2015. And that was really happening for two reasons. They have an unbalanced cost effectiveness screening test, the total resource cost test that was being applied with um, some of the costs, but not their symmetrical benefits. And because of a goal setting process that didn't really line up with the state's ambitious policies that, that we've all heard about. Um, and so there was a disconnect there. And to address these issues, the commission took up um, a new way of setting goals. And, and it's a fuel agnostic way of setting goals. It's called the total system benefit or TSB metric. Um, so instead of measuring success based on kilowatt hours, kilowatts and therms, it's going to transfer everything into sort of a, a, a monetary metric that encourages savings at the times that are most valuable and in the locations that are most valuable to the grid and really embracing a broader set of benefits, including, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. The way it does that is by having really transparent avoided costs that are tied to those state policy goals. So all of this sort of rests on a foundation of great avoided cost data. To Jen's point about data, um, that's really crucial. So you can't do this kind of goal setting unless you have that, that level of transparency and that level of granularity. But they, they've been doing that kind of modeling. And then we're able to set goals based on this. Other things that are exciting about these goals, in addition to being fuel agnostic, the time value enables you to bring in demand flexibility. They're also set over the life cycle of technologies, so that can eliminate some of the bias we sometimes see towards short-lived measures. So you're really seeing a good mix of policy tools within this goal setting that address some of the challenges we see around the country, but particularly have been seeing in California recently. Um, and then lastly, I'll just note that um, one of the challenges they faced is the relatively high cost of market transformation activities and equity focused activities. Um, and, and so because those are sometimes earlier stage in the process, there may be different barriers or the benefits may be benefits that aren't as easily captured. And so um, they've divided their portfolio into three separate buckets, an equity bucket, a market transformation bucket, and then a resource acquisition bucket. Remains to be seen how that will work, but that's one potential approach to addressing some of the tensions that we sometimes see in energy efficiency portfolios. I will say that um, they have yet to fully change the total resource cost test. They've, they've moved to using 1.0 instead of 1.25, which is a good improvement, um, but we still face some of the challenges that we had before with the design of cost effectiveness in California. So we've we've made some good progress there, but there's more still to do. And I think the Northeast has really a lot to um, to teach California about cost effectiveness testing. So I'll I'll give I'll give that to the Northeast there. That's exciting. Oh yeah, Nathan, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. I mean that is pretty exciting in California. And uh, I do think that a lot of other states can kind of learn on how regulators can lead in, for example, in what's happening in California. As far as Massachusetts go, uh, there was a climate act passed earlier this year. And it's pretty exciting. It does a bunch of different things. Uh, I'll highlight a few of them. So the first and foremost thing it does is sets Massachusetts on a path for decarbonization. Uh, what I like most about this aspect of it is it does include midterm requirements. So every five years, there are requirements rather than setting some goal for decarbonization at a point in the future that uh, could potentially lead to pushing off any real change. So I like that there are requirements every five years that need to be met. 
in the Massachusetts bill. It also includes changes to like appliance standards, which is really great. What I'm perhaps most excited about is the environmental justice aspect of the bill. So it actually codifies a definition for environmental justice and really requires the Commonwealth to integrate feedback and consideration of environmental justice community in almost all decisions, at least all decisions related to energy. That is critically important because Aaron, I, I think one of the other groups that really needs to be considered, you had missed, uh, mentioned like regulators and governors and legislators, but they all should be listening to the communities themselves. And one thing that we need to get away from is projecting what should be done for, say, environmental justice or disadvantaged communities or low and moderate income households. Like, instead of projecting, we should be listening to what they need and what they want. And I think Massachusetts does a start of that. Uh, New York has done something similar in their climate bill uh, that Jen was talking about. And Illinois is another example of a state. They passed a bill very recently that is promising in its potential. Actually, Nathan, I'm just so glad that you brought that up. Um, and we actually had a come, we had a question come in from the audience, um, specifically asking what methods of community engagement has you have you seen as equitable and effective? So um, I would like to kind of maybe take a minute to have a discussion, Nathan, Rachel, and then Jen, maybe even from like the metrics and measurement area of policy shifts that you see help change this approach to one that you were talking about, Nathan, where we put communities at the center. Um, so that's very general, but does, if anyone could jump, jump in or has any thoughts right away, go ahead. If not, I will refine the question. <laughs> well, I, I think a lot of states are really struggling with this, in all honesty. Like uh, one thing, you know, especially in the regulatory sphere, there's a tradition of doing what we've done in the past. Uh, precedent, basically, you know, so precedent guides so many things. So if we think about, say, public hearings, as an example, public hearings are often held at a central location, and normally during the daytime, we actually need to totally change that altogether. So public hearings should be in the communities that are impacted during different times of the day. And there's been progress on that, uh, but I don't think anyone has really like nailed it or gotten it right exactly. So that's an example, but overall for like in Massachusetts, the environmental justice components of the climate bill, there is a requirement now that agencies actually go and listen or solicit the feedback from the EJ communities. And that's a good start. But how we actually do that, I don't know that that's really been figured out yet. Yeah, I'll jump in to share that um, I think Nathan's point about reaching people where they are makes a lot of sense. And then I think the next stage beyond that is valuing people's time. So um, some states have some form of intervener compensation that's usually associated with really formal participation in processes and, and serving as a, as a formal intervener. I think it's really important to, um, to value what, what different communities bring to the conversation. And that means two things. One is literally compensating them for their time and figuring out mechanisms to do that um, because their time is valuable and they're offering something to make programs and policies more effective. Um, but it also means thinking about what is the objective of this engagement? Is it purely education? Is it purely letting people know something? Is it getting their feedback on an idea that a policymaker already has? Or is it co-creating with that community? Or, or perhaps even further, is it an idea that the community brings forward and gets support from government agencies or utilities in enacting? So I think there's a broad spectrum of, of what engagement means. Um, and there's, there's a lot of good research out there from, from community-based organizations into what that spectrum looks like. So I think it's important for, for example, in Massachusetts, the regulators to really think about what are we trying, what are we hoping to do? What's the objective of this engagement? Um, and how can we do that in a way that really values 
um, the contributions that folks are making. I would just add to that that similarly, the the New York Climate Act um, definitely um, has an important vision around getting that community um, input. Um, we're we're actually involved in an effort right now to go to the communities and to collect um, their input and to listen as to what are the barriers and opportunities for engaging in energy efficiency, engaging in um, resilience projects, engaging in workforce. Um, you know, for clean energy. So we are, you know, trying to listen and document all that feedback um, and have it be actionable for uh, the state programs that are aimed at meeting this overall goal of 40% of the benefits, right, of spending. Um, and, and really, I think it just suggests that, um, you know, most likely the equity outcomes that we are seeking, um, you know, will require some different program designs. Um, there are ways, certainly, that we can lean into certain programs, um, certain strategies, you know, that we're undertaking right now, as I mentioned, you know, within workforce, within, you know, clean green schools, um, obviously, continued significant support for low and moderate income, but I think we might be seeing um, that some different um, designs and different program focus um, might come about through this input um, in order to really direct um, the funds to achieve the, the equity outcomes fully. Um, and I, I think I would just echo a statement made earlier that, you know, we, um, um, you know, we, we know what what metrics, what benefit metrics and outcome metrics we can, um, you know, easily track and, and how we define those and how we get our data. Um, but I think we we have been trying very hard and need to be open minded about what are the, the metrics, the benefits, the outcomes that really matter, you know, sort of to these populations that are going to resonate, you know, with them. Um, and, and I think that's going to go beyond the traditional set of, of metrics, you know, success metrics that we look to. Great. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for those answers. That was very insightful. Um, and um, so for the next part of this conversation, I think I kind of want to take a little bit of a deep dive in some new regulatory processes that are that are underway that I think maybe tie in this getting community knowledge and also adopting changing practices in energy efficiency. Um, and I think um, I'm speaking about specifically, um, Nathan, your work around performance incentives mechanisms in Connecticut. And, um, and then also, Rachel, I think I would like to point to you to highlight the future planning working group and empower just to get you both ready. Um, but Nathan, first, I kind of want to jump to you because um, the I, I know I've heard you mention at some of the performance incentive mechanisms, I believe studies or meetings that you are running, um, the idea to change the structure um, or how we change the performance incentive structure um, there was a new idea proposed in Hawaii that actually came from stakeholder participation and was adopted. And that is something that I don't think happens very often when we're thinking about changing the regulatory landscape. And so if you could provide the story about that and then kind of what's going on in Connecticut and how you're organizing um, kind of the coalition there. Sure. So broadly speaking, I'll, I'll say that a lot of this falls under the umbrella of performance-based regulation. Uh, and some people will joke like, oh, you know, if you call it incentive regulation, we have incentive regulation right now. You know, the cost of service model is incentive regulation. It provides an incentive. But to me, I think that that really just altogether misses the broader picture, which is, no, no, no. We want to try to figure out a better way to align the utilities financial motivations with the desires and outcomes of that state and most importantly like the people in that state and if we can do that then i think a lot of things get easier so making energy efficiency a lot easier to to deploy uh, if the utilities have uh, the correct financial incentives now to be clear, a lot of the tools in the performance-based regulation toolbox, so to speak, have been around for a long time. 
So in energy efficiency plans, we have incentive mechanisms. So a lot of times that's based on kilowatt savings or kilowatt hour savings. And now we just need to figure out how to like expand that and go further. So it, Hawaii, you have brought up the example I think there is, is really encouraging. So Hawaii started the regulators and actually the legislature started looking at performance-based regulation a little bit more broadly in order to reduce the cost of the system to make sure that it was cleaner. Uh, Hawaii ran on a lot of diesel power, so it was very expensive and obviously dirty. So they started holding these stakeholder sessions. And one of the things that came out of that was an individual was really pushing like, let's have an incentive if the utilities can exceed the renewable portfolio standard. And that was reiterated multiple times and it started to gain steam and eventually it was adopted as one of the performance incentives in Hawaii. And that's the type of thing that I think overall we wanna see more broadly. I would love for people to actually start to think about what do we want out of the energy system? Like what's the desired outcome, the, the end state, if you will. And then let's have people talk about it in front of the regulator, in front of the legislators. And that's how we can actually try to get a vision for the future. And once we can really start to get more people talking about this, more ideas, then we can actually see the regulators like show them there is a desire for this outcome. And so that's when we can actually start to start to change that utility business model. Thank you so much for that. Oh yeah, thank you so much for that overview. And Rachel, I believe, yeah, if you would like to go ahead and talk about what's happening in Maryland, I think we might get an example of what Nathan was talking about. I think so, yeah. So in um, in Maryland, they have a future programming work group, which is a long name. And that is designed to take a look at MPOWER, which is the energy efficiency programs that the electric, gas, and dual fuel utilities run. And see what needs to be updated for the future, future programming. Um, there's been a lot of chatter in those dockets recently about some of the things we've been talking about today, the need to expand the definition of what energy efficiency looks like, a need to align with greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and Maryland has some pretty ambitious goals that have come out of um, administrative working groups in other parts of, of Maryland's government, um, but that has yet to sort of get reflected in energy efficiency. And so I, I will not read to you the full list of things that are being tackled in this working group, but needless to say, there are 14 different topics ranging from business model issues to goal structure to um, you name it, cost effectiveness testing. It's quite the group. Um, and, and they have this ambitious remit because they're really sort of taking a look at the whole and saying, what do we need to do differently? It's being sponsored by the commission um, and, and, and a judge who's sort of managing the process, but there are a wide variety of different stakeholders involved. And I'll maybe just highlight one area where I think they're making really interesting progress, which is in setting different goals. They haven't set the exact goals yet for what those will be, but they've created a consensus structure for what a new set of goals might look like. They've said, okay, we, we know that greenhouse gas is gonna be our priority. So as a whole, we wanna set a greenhouse gas abatement goal. It's measured on a life cycle basis and that has a predefined trajectory measure lifetime um, and, and potentially interim targets, right? Some of the things that Nathan was talking about in the Massachusetts context. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, okay, what's eligible? So they've made a list of the wide variety of potential demand side resources that might be eligible. And the way they're thinking about structuring this is saying, we want at least a minimum of some resources, right? We wanna make sure we have a minimum amount of, um, for example, resources that are going to low income populations of, um, uh, of overall electric energy efficiency. Um, Cause we wanna make sure we're, we're making progress on that. And we might have a maximum on some other things. So for example, refrigerants are a, a place where you can make a lot of progress. They're not necessarily as directly energy related, but the structures and the programs that we have for energy efficiency could be used to get a ton of GHG reductions in the refrigerant space. But it's new, we haven't tested it yet. So maybe for the first few years, 
we'll put a maximum on that. We'll test it for a little bit. And so they're playing with this idea of minimums and maximums um, within a goal structure. And I think it's an, an, a really interesting idea that really came about because of stakeholder and consensus building um, amongst different parties. Now, getting to the specific numbers is going to require a little bit more elbow grease, um, but the, the consensus has been able to emerge around a general framework. I think that's a, an exciting opportunity, something for people should be tracking. Yes, thank you, Jen. Actually, I'm curious to hear your reaction to that process, being someone that works on the back end of these programs. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is interesting. Um, and I think that um, really in New York State, the, the goals of the Climate Act are intended to be um, applying to all of our um, clean energy program investments. And, you know, NYSERDA is um, responsible for getting roughly 40% of the way to the state uh, overarching energy efficiency goal, but the utilities have a significant portion of that as well. Um, you know, so uh, we need to be kind of thinking about this as a, a, a statewide effort. There are obviously also other um, agencies, other authorities making investments that are going to really matter here too. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a matter of kind of the the whole set of programs, you know, working well together, really. Um, uh, you know, the the types of things that an ICERTA is best, you know, positioned to, to take on and go after um, on a statewide basis, the types of things that the utilities are best positioned in their role and their engagement with customers to to take on, for example, in, in, our, in the realm of, you know, um, the the clean energy programs you know that are regulated by the public service commission at least that's kind of how i think about it is that it's really all hands on deck um to reach these big goals we all have our our pieces um that we have to deliver on and i think that we all have our strengths um you know that we bring to the table um in terms of the the types of offerings yeah thank you jen and yeah, I just wanted to highlight, as Rachel was talking about the future um, planning working group, I've actually been attending some of the sessions, and it is my sixth state that I sat in for energy efficiency planning in the past three years, and I think it is maybe one of the best processes I have ever seen speaking. Um, it's very open, very, everyone's ideas are heard, so I, I would second the watch, watch, watch what they're doing, uh, see what happens from that Empower Working Group. Um, so, yeah, so we got a little deep dive with the regulatory, uh, regulatory bits there, and we have about 10 minutes left, so I kind of want to take a step back and see if anyone, um, I guess, sees any policy changes, maybe for, from legislation across, across the whole nation um, that are maybe helping to um, start enact these processes below. So any legislation that you're watching or any states um, that you're watching, um, and I'll open this question up for everyone for now. Well, I'll jump in. I, I'm going to go with a nice and naughty list here. So I think Illinois is an example of a state that that's really doing something I would say highly encouraging. So I mentioned they, they passed a bill recently and it was originally called the Clean Energy Jobs Act. It's It's been rebranded as the Energy Transition Act. But basically it's really trying to figure out bringing that workforce development aspect into that clean energy economy. So making it more diverse and equitable. The bill is about a thousand pages long. So there's a lot in it. But it's it's really encouraging. I'm extremely excited to see where Illinois is going on that. Uh, so pay attention to Illinois. On the naughty side, I, I can't help but bring up a bill from a couple of years ago, HB6 in Ohio. I think it is an example of things gone horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, there was, as if you've heard about this, it may be in the context of corruption, but in that, in that situation, they eliminated the energy efficiency programs and the renewable energy programs in the idea of cost savings. And it was extremely short-sighted, you know, cost savings in year zero, if you will. But, you know, let's not pay attention to any of the cost savings in the future type of thing. And uh, it's, it's legislation gone bad, if you will, from my perspective. 
couldn't agree more on those. I'll jump in and, and share um, uh, maybe just sort of a global thought about particularly the Northeast and the opportunity in the Northeast and maybe an example from somewhere else that I think highlights why it's important. I think the, the thing that I've been seeing in the Northeast is a real need to get everybody rowing in the same direction. Um, I'm thinking particularly of New Jersey where Aaron and I did a lot of work together over the past few years and where um, there was a clear desire from the consumer advocate, from the utilities, from the BPU, from the governor's office, you name it, to move energy efficiency forward in a real way. The dispute was how do we do it? What's the business model? Who's responsible for what? Some of the questions Jen mentioned around governance and roles. All of that was the, the messy stuff that we had to figure out together. And, and they went through a process and I think have a really good first set of answers that they'll be trying in, in this first cycle around that. Um, but to me, the lesson of that was we had to figure out how to channel everyone's energy in the right direction. I think that is more the, the challenge in the Northeast than, um, than direct opposition in the same way. There are exceptions in, in particular states, but by and large, it's a matter of getting ourselves to row together well. And I'll just highlight for folks Colorado, which in this last session passed a whole bevy of really exciting legislation that touches on the demand side. Three that I'll quickly highlight that I think are going to create really interesting challenges for their regulator in terms of getting it all to row together. Um, one is a new law around gas DSM that expands cost effectiveness measures and, and really places a premium on gas savings. The second is a requirement for beneficial electrification plans from their electric utilities. And then the third is a clean heat standard, or uh, I think that's what it's framed as, and um, which requires the gas utilities to meet um, greenhouse gas reduction standards over time. And they can use a variety of different tools to do that, biogas, hydrogen, energy efficiency, electrification. And so I think that's really interesting. It's, it's an approach that targets the different entities in the state and says, okay, we've all got to get rowing. They didn't do it comprehensively in one bill. They did it in some piecemeal pieces. And so they're going to have a really interesting challenge of how do they knit all of that together in a comprehensive way. Um, so another state to watch with, I think, some real analogy to some of the northeastern states. Great. Thank you. Um, I guess for our next question, I think, oh, sorry, um, I kind of wanted to ask you guys, none of us are utilities or work at utilities, but I was wondering if you've seen any utilities kind of take initiative on their own or any programs that you would like to kind of put the spotlight on that are being innovative in either clean energy or equity ways. I, well, I, I was trying not to talk too much, but I, I'll go. <laughs> so I, I think a lot of people would point to Green Mountain Power in Vermont as an example of being innovative. And their pre previous CEO like definitely put it a, an interesting spin of, you know, the we should be actually be working to making the current utility obsolete, basically. And I, I think that that is inspiring. Uh, I think there has been some bumps in the road when it comes to Green Mountain Power. They've done a lot in the, in the way of pilots, uh, but that's primarily the mechanism that they've used. They haven't rolled out programs more broadly like I would like to see. And then in regard to some other examples, you know, actually New York has done a, a pretty great job when it comes to non-wires alternatives. And then we, we can go to some municipal utilities with examples. Uh, but as far as comprehensive across the board, uh, I think there's still a lot of work that we can do, uh, but there's examples of encouraging signs. So I've been working with Eversource in Massachusetts on a low income solar proposal as an example. And I've been extremely encouraged with how Eversource has been working on that. So uh, there are positive signs of development here. Thank you, and Jen, I'd, oh yeah, Jen, go ahead. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Well, I think that, um, you know, NYSERDA and the utilities in New York State, um, one of the 
best ways that we can really work together and leverage our strengths is, you know, for NYSERDA to play a role in helping to pilot and test out and um, kind of prove the, the the value of certain new, uh, you know, and novel initiatives, including potentially, you know, undertaking new business models, et cetera. And so that is, that was really the genesis of the, the partnership that I mentioned earlier around pay for performance, you know, which I think we, you know, all have a continued high interest in, uh, in moving forward. Um, you know, and, and I would say also, um, there have been numerous examples over the years where kind of, um, you know, we can prove something out on a smaller pilot scale initially, and then, you know, maybe kind of hand it off um, for broader um, utility implementation across the state with NYSERDA providing um, other market supports. Um, we are working um, collaboratively with the utilities, obviously, under the New York State Clean Heat Program, where the utilities are offering the incentives for heat pumps, and NYSERDA is offering a whole plethora of supports for workforce and and consumer awareness and marketing and all, all of those sorts of things. Um, I think we probably uh, all realize that we need to reach an even bigger scale and higher scale on on, on that effort. Um, you know, and another another example I think is in um, you know in LMI Solar. So I um, would echo you know some of the things that that Nathan is mentioning um, in terms of and and just kind of note that that partnership. Um, you know, role um, has has seemed to to work pretty well. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Anything to add very quickly? I'll just add quickly that um, you know we've been talking a lot about programs that utilities run. Utilities also have a planning responsibility. They're responsible for making sure that um, that the lights stay on, and a lot of that involves forward thinking investment, and a little bit less so in the Northeast. But I do think there's some really exciting examples around the country of utilities that are starting to do a much more comprehensive view of planning that are treating energy efficiency as a resource in their resource planning and their distribution system planning that are not just treating efficiency as a resource, but thinking about how can we best pair the attributes of energy efficiency, demand flexibility, and renewable and storage resources together. When you are thoughtful about doing that, you can um, avoid a lot of the planned fossil uh, investments that we're seeing around the country and, and potentially retire some of the existing investments as well. Um, so a couple of places to highlight are, are Indiana, where a number of the utilities have done a, a better job there, a little bit less so on the efficiency side, but certainly on demand flexibility, um, and Glendale Water and Power, um, which is a, a utility in California that did a really sort of innovative process for, for replacing a, a local asset. And so I, I think thinking about the planning role is really important as well as the sort of customer facing program side. They really inform each other, but utilities have to be thinking about um, these resources really as resources. And it's hard to do, it requires a lot of data. It is, it is a challenging task for sure, but definitely wanna lift up those that are doing a great job there. Thank you so much. And I will uh, take this moment to say thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for this amazing discussion about energy efficiency and where it can go. Um, and I see Aira has popped up to wish us well. I have indeed. Thank you, Erin. And thanks to our panelists. It's so great to hear leadership examples, not only from within the deep region, but from around the country. We really appreciate you sharing those with us and with the time. And I wanted to say good morning to everyone and thanks for joining the third day of the NEEP Summit Sessions 2021. As you can see, I'm in a different location with a different attire today. I'm actually calling in from uh, Northern California. Um, I traveled through some incredible, um, some incredible terrain over the last day and saw a lot of the effects that climate change is having in Northern California that we've all heard and read about, but it was really shocking to see how dry California is and how real some of these changes are. And it made me realize, you know, how the imperative of all of the work that we do and that we need to do work together to achieve the goals, not only for climate, but for equity that we've been talking about over the last three days. So this morning I was struck by the work that the people of Chelsea are doing to build resilient local energy in their community, and also the last conversation about evolving goals, as well as our own technical hiccup this morning and my need to adapt to where I am today. And I think the lesson of this morning is flexibility. 
we're all going to need to be creative and flexible and thinking about how to uh, adapt what we've been doing for the past few decades to, to the changing goals and the needs of the future. So before we move on, I wanted to again thank our state sponsors, NYSERDA, our Connecticut partners, Connecticut Deep, UI, and Eversource, and our Rhode Island partners, the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources, National Grid, and the Rhode Island Energy Efficiency and Resource Management Council. You just heard about Jen's work at NYSERDA, and we've also heard from Connecticut and Rhode Island over the course of the last two plus days. So these states are not only leaders in the region, but they are gold sponsors of the Summit Sessions 2021, and they are the reason that we can all be here today. So I wanted to say thank you to our state partners in Rhode Island, New York, and Connecticut. So moving on, in our last panel, Rachel Gold's first words were, energy efficiency needs to evolve to meet climate equity and other goals. And our next session builds on this concept. So our speakers will delve into how energy efficiency regulators and policymakers can create new kinds of partnerships with their counterparts in air regulation to meet state climate goals. I wanted to invite Rich Sedano, who's president and CEO, CEO of the Regulatory Assistance Project to join me. Hi, Rich. Hello, Era. how are you? Great, it's great to see you, as you I'm know. On, I'm on the West Coast also. Oh, gosh, well, <laughs> you're up really early as well. I hope you've had yep. as much coffee as I have in the last 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, as you know, this is NEAT's 25th anniversary. You have a long history with NEAT. Well, we do. Uh, it was fun for me when I was at the Vermont Department of Public Service to watch to uh, create NEAP, and I was, I think I was a keynote speaker at a NEAP summit in like, I don't know, one of the first of them, which was really, uh, I didn't quite know what I was getting myself into, not just that, that day, but the whole relationship with NEAP since I've been, uh, was on the NEAP board for 19 years. Uh, it was, it's been a great relationship with NEAP, and I'm glad to be with you all today. Well, I don't know if you've ever expected to be participating in a NEAT summit in this kind of environment, but as I said, flexibility and um, you know whatever it needs to keep pushing this work forward. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Um, I guess the other thing I'd say is that, as you know, NEAP is all about relationships and partnerships, and I am really excited to hear where you're gonna go with this session about new kinds of alliances that can support support the work. So. I'll stop talking and I'll I'll leave you to it. Thanks again, Rich. Thanks, Aaron, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, I, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, the Regulatory Assistance Project, of which I'm the CEO, has been focused on the connections between energy and the environment, really for our entire history. We were founded by uh, former Maine regulators, David Moskovitz and Cheryl Harrington, with the idea that the environment was not adequately reflected in utility regulation. And um, since then, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground uh, helping environmental regulators to use energy efficiency as a tool and, uh, and to reflect the value of the environmental benefits in energy efficiency programs. And today we're gonna to go uh, way beyond the, the, the basics. Uh, there's a lot of stuff people on this call should uh, already know um, that uh, energy efficiency is an effective air quality tactic, that it reduces risk, reduces cost, and that it has spillover benefits for health, water, transportation, and while transforming uh, markets and improving businesses. So, uh, I think we also, all of us here on this call, recognize increasing urgency. Is anybody paying attention to the UN this week and the, and the COP very soon uh, to address climate and equity outcomes? So thanks for joining us today and, and sticking with us to the end of the summit. Uh, we're going to end at 45 minutes past the hour, so we have uh, a, a lot to do uh, in a short period of time. Your questions will be welcome, uh, although I have a lot of things I want to ask our speakers about. And our speakers, uh, I want to welcome them, Coralie Cooper from NESCOM, the uh, Deputy Executive Director, and Sue Coakley, uh, citizen of the world and longtime and, and founding uh, NEEP Executive Director, who uh, I, I sense is, is continuing to do a lot of great things ar around the, the country. Um, uh, Coralie, uh, first, and then Sue, would you take just a couple of minutes to say a little bit more about yourselves and our topic today? 
Yes, absolutely. And thank you very much, Rich. And thanks to the organizers. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I, I, for those of you who aren't uh, so familiar with NESCOM, NESCOM is an association of eight state air pollution control programs, the six New England states and New York and New Jersey. And NESCOM has been around for 50 years and we bring together coalitions of states to develop policies and actions to spur decarbonization, reduce criteria and toxic pollution and to, in order to improve public health and the environment. Um, and I'm the, uh, the deputy director at NESCOM. Um, thank you. Okay, Sue. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be back here at a NEEP summit. Um, and Rich, nice to be talking with you and Coralie. Um, I'll just say that um, when I founded NEEP uh, 25 years ago, uh, NESCOM was actually an inspiration for me. Uh, it was already states working together to uh, improve the environment through the air quality, um, meeting the Clean Air Act requirements. And I felt that we could do the same thing to advance energy efficiency. And I'm very excited today to be talking about bringing together uh, air regulators and energy efficiency in a, in a closer relationship to advance our goals for decarbonization across the region. Well, thanks, Sue. And both, both of you are just really pivotal in, in the success that many of us are seeing across the NEEP footprint, uh, which goes from Maine all the way down to D.C. Um, and so I wanted to give you both just a, a, an opportunity to say a few words about the main points you wanted to make today, and then we'll, we'll dig in. But we will, I want to be sure that the main things you want to say come out early. So, uh, Coralie, what are the key points you want to make today? Um, well, I think, first of all, the direction we need to go in and where we need to aim is for, as many people have said in previous panels, much greater efficiency in buildings, followed by electrification, and then renewable energy to completely decarbonize our buildings. And we need to go there quickly. We need to address new building, new construction, and our existing buildings. So we have a monumental task in front of us. And um, I, I think I'd also like to say that the, the states have quite a bit of regulatory authority through the Clean Air Act, um, both uh, around non-attainment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, around targets for regional haze, um, and other aspects of the Clean Air Act. And then there's a lot of authority in the new climate acts that have been being discussed in previous sessions. So I think that we need to think about that authority, hone our, our policies, and then talk about integrating those policies with other programs, with the energy programs. Great, thanks. Yeah, I'm struck by the work in our work at RAP, how um, many public officials um, don't explore the full measure of their authority. And it's been um, a, a, a continuous effort for many of us to educate uh, public officials about uh, pushing the envelope without without uh, creating any any legal issues to do to do more to be more effective sue what are the key points you want to make yeah well i'll just I'll, I'll build on that in terms of pushing the policy envelope um it i think to achieve the aggressive building decarbonization climate stabilization uh, and resiliency goals that states have met it requires policy integration we really need to work across a range of regulations uh, whether it's air regulatory policy, utility regulatory policy, building regulatory policy, building codes. Um, there's, there's a range of, of policy frameworks that I think need to come together. And I'm excited by the work of states through their climate councils and climate plans that are beginning to achieve that integration. We can talk more about that today. And the other key point that I think is important, um, something that NEPA has worked on for years, which is work, having states work together. And uh, we see building energy codes for existing buildings, the very successful policy along with appliance standards. We also now need to look at building performance standards for existing buildings and how can that meet air quality goals for the states. And I think that's an important discussion and how can we align those efforts regionally uh, to go forward. So those are some key points I wanted to touch today. You know, RAP works in Europe, and uh, we're working on minimum energy performance standards there too, as you probably know. And so, uh, and it does seem like Europe perhaps has a better appetite for that than than Americans do. So we we need to change some minds in addition to educate some officials. 
And the other thing that I think uh, is consistent with uh, a lot of the work that we do is breaking down silos and collaboration across uh, within state government and then across interests in state government and then across states. All of that seems necessary to make the progress that we need to make because everybody is kind of worried about being the only one. Uh, being a Vermont public official, I know <laughs> we, we, we had all these great ideas, but then you know it's hard to, hard to be the one that stuck out in, in the little state of Vermont and worry about border effects and things like that. Well, Coralie, I, I, I wanted to ask you about building performance standards. Sue mentioned uh, the, that we might be able to, to create a better set of expectations for buildings. One of the things that, that prompts for me is um, can air quality regulators uh, factor in the pollution and greenhouse gas savings that might come from uh, up raising the floor on building standards in their uh, regional haze plans, uh, any kind of any kind of state implementation plans that they might be doing. Yeah, so there, you know, there are a number of mechanisms on, under the Clean Air Act. Um, uh, you know, the, the states can set standards for boilers, the boilers that heat uh, apartment buildings, institutions like museums and other. So that so that you know that's one mechanism, um, and. Uh, Generally, if if the state or an area in the state is in non-attainment of the national ambient air quality standards, then um, they they can move ahead with varying degrees of um, you know uh, sort of regulatory stringency on different standards. So there there are opportunities there, and uh, the same with with regional haze. So the states are setting goals. And um, they have to put in place measures to, to reach those goals. Now, one thing that's interesting about the Clean Air Act is that um, for the Northeast anyway, you know, we have non-attainment areas for ozone, um, but none for, for particulate right now. I mean, that could change with a new particulate standard. But um, so the, the heating system is the largest source of emissions in a building. And those, those emissions are in, are in the winter. Um, and so kind of the nexus with the, um, the need to reduce ozone forming pollutants is, is, is not really there. California has standards for, for NOx for um, heating systems, um, but, uh, or some, some of the districts do, but it's a little bit of a challenge. So I think you know, one of the challenges is to look very closely at our, uh, the regulatory authority and see you know, where, where is the, policy lever and, and take advantage of that, um, look at our inventory, et cetera. And then on the, but certainly on the climate acts that everyone has been discussing um, in previous sessions, there's quite a bit of authority there and that differs from state to state. But um, I think, you know, there's a very good nexus there with requirements that could be put in place and uh, energy efficiency, efficiency standards. And I just want to list one, one is, um, the you know the newly announced commission on clean heat in Massachusetts, where they're going to uh, consider a declining cap on greenhouse gas emissions from heating fuels. So that that's one example of a very good nexus. Well, great. Um, the, the the always the concern about uh, about bringing another state agency into the conversation about energy efficiency is them them wondering if it, if it's their job. Um, and Sue, you've had a, a long experience of sort of observing this and trying to sort of find, find, the, find the doors, find the locks, unlock the locks and get in. Uh, maybe you can reflect on, on what it's been like to, to try to make these arguments over the years. Yeah, um, uh, it's a good question, uh, Rich. I think uh, one of the interesting examples I'll point to of uh, integrating two regulatory frameworks effectively for energy efficiency has been energy efficiency programs paid for by ratepayer funded programs, uh, and then uh, building codes and standards. Uh, and uh, many programs, efficiency programs for new construction right now, will support the implementation of a stretch code. That's true in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, a few other states. 
And so the funding to build market capability to implement that higher stretch code, more efficient code, uh, has been supported through the efficiency programs, which is getting the savings and meeting their savings goals on a community level, which is more powerful than just an individual building level. So I think that's a, a, a good example of how programs can work together. I would say something that Nescom has in its wheelhouse and capability that I think is important is to be able to determine for states and the region, uh, what do we need to do with emissions from heating systems or homes and buildings what, what level of emission reduction do we need so that we have that, that goal and then work with things like building codes and standards and efficiency programs, as well as community development issues uh, to address uh, equity issues uh, to actually move forward and implement something. So I, I do think we have some, some experience and success with this that we could build on. Well, thanks. Well, I want to transition to talk about uh, low and moderate income families and and how uh, looking ahead we can take all that we've learned and and do a, a better job with where they look where they live uh, so so what, what what would you say is the agenda for addressing the needs of low and moderate income families with uh, with energy efficiency and i imagine there's an environmental benefit wrapped into that yes well, this has actually been quite a discussion at the summit the past couple of days. In fact, I'm, I'm excited to uh, highlight maybe a couple of things talked about here, but mm -hmm. uh, energy efficiency can address multiple needs and issues uh, in uh, low-income communities, marginalized communities. Uh, it, they live in poorer building stocks, uh, generally uh, are uncomfortable, not necessarily have good ventilation and health, um, and they also suffer from high asthma rates and and a range of things. So if you improve the efficiency of buildings, you can make a better indoor living environment, improve uh, health outcomes for the uh, residents. Um, you can also uh, help, we talked a bit about resiliency. A lot of disadvantaged communities live in areas that um, get the worst of climate impacts, whether they're heat islands or prone to flooding. If we make buildings and homes more efficient and also think about how to make them resilient or in, in place of flooding and, and reduce the likelihood of mold, for example. Uh, and I'll just, uh, one thing I, I heard about over the past couple of days that I thought was pretty interesting, how do you meet local disadvantaged community needs with their input through these programs and the role of community health assessments to identify and engage community participants in what matters most to them, what, what are their concerns and how can the programs and re resources to decarbonize and improve buildings also address other health outcomes that, that really matter to them. It's um, be nice to see all of that factored into the benefit cost tests that PUCs use. Mm -hmm. um, well, Coralie, uh, some might think of air quality regulators as, as uh, scientists disconnected from uh, the low and moderate income family experience, but what can your constituency do to address these societal equity concerns that uh, we've always had, but are emerging in a bigger way this year, it seems, than ever? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, the states are, are really prioritizing this and have created um, stakeholder processes and uh, Panels, for example, the, under the um, New York's Climate Action Council, um, they have they have an equity panel and, and a housing panel, and uh, they're both um, developing recommendations around equity. Um, so I think I think Jen mentioned in the last session that um, that they are also developing criteria for disadvantaged communities. So how what are the metrics? How do we measure? You know, where do we focus resources? Um, and some of the ideas that are coming out of uh, these, these work groups in, in New York and then other states, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, uh, many other states are also working very hard on, on EJ issues. But um, so prioritize clean heat and uh, or zero emission heat and zero emission cooking mm -hmm. in low and moderate income communities um, or households. And uh, just to bring in, you know, the idea of, like, again, kind of... Um, meshing with other programs, if, if that's that's a priority and maybe there's a zero emission standard, then um, you know, accessing green bank funds or other types of funds or low interest loans 
to, to help with any um, you know higher cost because that's also a priority in the discussions in the states. How do you um, ensure that costs don't go up for low and um, moderate income households? So that those are just a, a, a few examples of how the states are, are thinking about this and going about um, trying to address the issue. Uh, um, the so did you want to I just add, I just wanted yeah, to add one other thing um, that I think as we look at serving um, low and moderate income customers, uh, in my work over the years on efficiency with the National Consumer Law Center, one thing I've come to understand that building codes and standards that apply to everything are actually one of the best policies for uh, low income populations because it means that all appliances, all buildings have to be more efficient. We have to begin to apply that, I believe, to the existing building stock because one of the one of the challenges is that if you just improve some buildings, and particularly in a low income community, the value of those buildings may increase because now they're low carbon, and then people can't afford to live in them anymore. You just lost the affordability issue. If we have performance standards for all buildings, everything is being invested in, and we do need these co-investment models, Coralie, that you're talking about, so it's affordable and give priority. To those who can least afford it to make sure it's possible. But if we had a minimum standard for everybody, that actually helps maintain affordability. And that's a really key outcome. Great, thanks. Well, I wanted to ask Coralie, so I know a, a lot of people on this call know, know Nescom, but uh, they're maybe a little bit vague on exactly what Nescom does and can do. So Coralie, I wanted to just give you a chance to say a few things about what Nescom specifically uh, can and might do uh, across the region to to uh, to connect energy efficiency, energy and environment opportunities. Yeah, so I, I just want to bring in an analog, you know, an example really from the transportation sector um, to to start off, and that is that in the transportation sector we have Section One Seventy Seven of the Clean Air Act, which is a very clear policy mechanism where states can adopt California standards for vehicles and their zero emission vehicle standards. So in the, at, in the building, um, when we talk about buildings, as, as others have mentioned, we mentioned here, there's authority in many places. So we have the, um, we have the code um, officials who are overseeing the code. We have energy officials, we have air quality officials. And so there's both the need for a lot of coordination, there's an evaluation that's needed on what the policy levers are. And so what, what we're doing to get started in this area is um, we've done some analysis on the air quality and greenhouse gas impacts of switching from um, heating fuels, fossil fuel heating fuels to um, electric heating systems. So we're going to continue that work. So some, some technical work to help um, clarify, you know, where the emissions potential is and then some policy work around clarifying authority. So, you know, some, some of those mechanisms around the Clean Air Act, where can we use those levers? What's the best lever? Is it a, you know, is it a, um, is it a declining standard? Is it a zero emission standard? Or how, how do you, and how do you implement that? And then so that, that's first kind of looking at policy and authority and clarifying. And then second, I think bringing together um, this, the states, um, both the energy programs and the air programs. I think that would be beneficial and the, the code um, officials as well and others. So try and bring everybody in the same room and lay out the information that we've found in our research. Um, you know, the states are already having these conversations, but I think having this across the region would be helpful. Thanks, Gorley. I think, uh, I hope we'll be hearing a lot more about NESCOM. Over, over the next few years on, on these topics. Um, Sue, I want to talk with you about money. Mm -hmm. We want to accelerate energy efficiency. I think there's some sense that nobody's doing all cost-effective energy efficiency and that we're worse off for that. But there's the issue of where the money comes from. I know you have some thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, Rich, thank you for the question. Uh, it really is, you know, show me the money is the question everybody has. Uh, it's going to be a co-investment model. Energy efficiency always has been a co-investment model. It's coming from ratepayers who have a value as well as individual home or building owners or residents that, that are making the investment. We'll need to do the same thing. Uh, now, of course, the price tag is much bigger when we talk about renovating and improving uh, existing buildings. 
but I, I do think that the co-investment going forward uh, needs to include federal funding. And the conversation earlier in the summit has been, what are states going to do with the federal funding that is already coming and more coming on infrastructure and related topics? And uh, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas uh, of how to channel that money to do a lot of work on weatherization, focusing on low incomes and innovations there, um, but also in supporting green banks uh, to be able to uh, have revolving loan funds and, and to make uh, money more available. Again, I'll come back to uh, having a common standard. I'm a, kind of a broken record on this, but if we have a common standard, the outcome we're trying to achieve, you know, one that is supported through analysis, what building energy performance or carbon emission performance uh, standard are we trying to achieve can actually help focus private sector money towards that outcome. When you have a hodgepodge of different requirements across state and local authorities, it makes it very hard for markets to invest in that and understand it. So I think uh, the money from the private sector requires us to standardize things a bit and make it more simple and straightforward. And that's always been part of the NEAP model is creating more consistency across states, so not for the sake of consistency, but because the businesses, the government, right, all, all, all sorts of things are benefited if there's consistency. Uh, we save money and things go better. Um, Coralie, do you have any thoughts about the money? There's there's uh, uh, some some connection between air quality and 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 compliance on on that side of of things. Do you have anything to add? Um, well, I mean, I would I would just add that um, it's really to to what Sue said that you know I think. Um, there, there are a lot of different things that are being discussed um, in the states, and you know, Sue named a lot of them. But uh, uh, unlocking private um, capital and and ensuring that um, you know there's a there's a just transition and costs don't go up for um, low and moderate income households. And I just want to bring up one example. I'm not sure if anyone brought this up so far in the summit, but um, in in New York City, the New York City Housing Authority has has is starting to use a private um, capital model where they can access private capital and as is talking about renovating a large housing complex and converting from fossil fuel heating to, to heat pumps, both to improve comfort, um, provide, um, you know, um, uh, and, you know, weatherization, and it would also significantly reduce emissions. Great. I want to ask about the public face of all of these topics. We're, 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 we've been a little bit on the policy wonk side of, of this, but there's a broad public communication aspect to this because it, it ends up being political. We want to uh, per perhaps generate more funds and, and more support, more, more durable support. Uh, Sue, what, what do you think about the challenge of communicating all of these things uh, who sh who should be out there selling these kinds of initiatives that, that from your perspective well uh, again I think the the multiple um, interests you know those who have something to gain need to actually be part of that uh, so we have seen that actually state and local government um, create forums for those discussions. I'm very impressed by a lot of the local engagement that's going on across New England and New York, where communities want to lead, and they're talking about what can we do, they're talking about clean heat standards, talking about efficiency and solar initiatives. Um, uh, so I think state and local government. Um, business has always played an important role in educating the public. Um, some of the sponsors of this of the summit uh, are, have, have uh, Mitsubishi, for example, um, have really important products that are responsive to the needs of the, the heat, the, the building stock in the Northeast to provide heat pumps that work for a range of populations. Um, but I also think that we have to come to those who are looking to improve economic opportunity and to look at the jobs and, and the business opportunities associated with this investment to improve our infrastructure, be climate resilient, and, and to mitigate carbon. So I think uh, it, it needs to come from these different points of view. Having common frameworks like state climate roadmaps really help get everybody on the same page, rowing in the same direction, uh, a topic in a previous session. Uh, so I think that's very helpful. But I, I think it's going to be multiple. And I, and I also have to add in healthcare. 
because as we improve buildings, we actually can make uh, homes and buildings healthier. And I think that's quite important. So I think from all those different points of view, we need to have uh, people speaking about the need for clean heat standards and efficiency. Great. Well, I want to get in one question from the chat uh, that came in to Coralie. There's a, a concern that some people have about uh, air quality regulation and conflict with public utility regulation. We have potential for, uh, for standards that uh, might factor in energy issues from air quality regulators and uh, concern that there's any conflict. Coralie, in, in a few seconds, What's your high level sense of whether that's a, an issue? And if it is, um, how do you think about it? Well, I, I would just say that generally, I think that, um, you know, kind of concern, is there, there are concerns, similar concerns in, in a number of different areas. And that tends to hold, it can hold policymakers back. Um, and so um, I, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, um, there is that possibility for, for conflict. And so the, I think the, the answer to that is to, 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 again, think through the policies very carefully and design them and simultaneously be talking with counterparts in other agencies, with utilities, so that these policies mesh and it's an integrated framework. Well, just a few minutes, we've managed to scratch the surface of emergent issues relating to how energy efficiency and environmental regulation, which have always been, in my mind, the same, the same family of issues, um, uh, are, are looking, looking as we look ahead to the meeting 2030 goals. Uh, it's inspiring to see um, the leaders of nations in New York City this week making pledges and they'll continue to do that in Scotland in November. All of us can do our little bit to, to make that happen. And um, Sue, any, do you have a, a final thought that you want to share after, uh, after this sh short conversation we've had? Well, I'll just say that at the end of the day, uh, energy efficiency is one of the most equitable and uh, most broadly available resources we have to actually achieve these emission reductions in the building sector. And I'm excited for what the benefits will be for the region. I look forward to NESCOM's uh, leadership uh, to make that real for air regulators. And Coralie, thanks, Sue. And Coralie, the last word for you. Yeah, similarly, I think that there are potentially tremendous health benefits that could be achieved from, um, you know, decarbonizing buildings and greatly improving energy efficiency in buildings. And uh, so that that's a wonderful synergy and can benefit the public and the environment. Well, thanks to both of you for making time and sharing your thoughts and, and, uh, and, and uh, to all, everyone who's listening, I hope that uh, you'll all do your part to think creatively about the ways that energy can help the environment and that uh, the environment can be credited for success in energy efficiency. And uh, with that, uh, Aira, I'll turn it back to, to you and Jess and uh, Thanks for the opportunity to moderate and host this conversation. Thank you, Rich, and, and thanks to Coralie and Sue. And you're right, scratching the surface is the right term. It's obviously just the beginning of a longer conversation. Again, environment, I heard health coming in again, as we heard yesterday, and I certainly look forward to continuing the work between NEEP and NESCOM in the future. Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break before we return for our final session, which is called Show Me the Money. So it's all, we've heard a lot of big ideas, a lot of progress, and it's all about how do we fund and finance the work that we need to do. So grab some coffee, grab some water, take a quick stretch, and we will see you in about 10 minutes for the last session. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. We've got one more session and it's an extremely critical one. So I wanted to invite Sam Kramer, Program Director at NASIO to join me on stage. And Sam, we're here to talk about, show me the money, it's all about the money. And before you get started, I just wanted to say this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I started my work in efficiency about 12 years ago, focused on energy efficiency finance and looking at some very 
uh, new and creative ways to finance energy efficiency work, things that are now common, common terms like PACE. So it's really exciting to me to see you lead this session with three folks who've really worked on solutions that, um, that are working and that are the kinds of things that we're going to need to, to get to decarbonization at scale and to get to equitable decarbonization. So thank you for leading this. I think it's a critical way to wrap up our discussion and I'll turn it over to you. Sure, and thank you so much, Aira. I really appreciate the invitation here and really excited to be leading this discussion here today. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I know you've had a lot of uh, good information uh, you know, brought into your brains in the last couple of days. We have one more session to go, we're in the home stretch. So uh, hopefully we can wrap this up in a, in a really strong way and give you a, a little bit more to digest uh, as, you, as you go away from this session. Um, for those of you who haven't yet met me, my name is Sam Kramer. I am NASIO's Financing and Planning Program Director. Uh, NASIO stands for the National Association of State Energy Officials, and we represent the 56 governor-designated state and territorial energy offices throughout the nation. So we've been around since the early 1980s, and we've really been kind of working on all things energy at the state level, um, including financing. And we, you know, we've, we've worked on CPACE, we've worked on green banks, and what we're kind of seeing here, you know, especially thinking through this from the energy office perspective is, is we're kind of entering a whole new frontier in terms of financing. Particularly, we were thinking about how do we make sure that, you know, especially when it comes to energy efficiency and, and other and those kinds of improvements, how do we really make sure that the benefits of energy efficiency are, are, are accessible by everyone? And in this way, you know, there's still a lot that the energy offices are thinking about in terms of how to best do that. Um, but we all recognize that, you know, financing and finding a way to get the capital dollars to where they're needed most is, is a really important thing to do and really, really good at, you know, and really, really good and, and needed uh, in order to get, you know, um, in order to really kind of get more of an equity focus into, into some of those communities. Um, so before we get started here, I'm, I'm joined by three, three panelists here um, who are all who are really excellent um, at thinking through some of these things and, and will help us have a nice discussion about really thinking through how to finance energy efficiency, particularly with, with, uh, with, uh, with respect to underserved communities. So what we'd like to do before I kick the discussion off is, is I'd like to um, have them introduce themselves in turn and provide just a little bit of information on the companies that they work for. So uh, we'll go uh, kind of around here in a circle. So I guess we'll start with uh, Glenn and then we'll go with Carrie and then with Lori. Uh, so Glenn, feel free to introduce yourself. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I'm Glenn Schatz. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Block Power. Uh, Block Power does project development and financing for multifamily and small commercial buildings, predominantly in LMI communities. Uh, Block Power has been around for about seven or eight years. Um, before Block Power, I led business development and strategy at an IoT company. And before that, had the pleasure of uh, working for ARA, where I led the small commercial uh, buildings portfolio at the Department of Energy's Building Technology Office. Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie O'Neill, and I lead Inclusive Prosperity Capital. We are a not-for-profit investment fund, and we operate at the intersection of community development and clean energy finance and climate impact. Um, and we spun out of the Connecticut Green Bank to take some of the strategies that we had innovated there to scale nationally. We focus exclusively on underserved markets, which we define as both low and moderate income communities, as well as credits that are underserved, maybe because of technology or they're harder to underwrite um, because of deal size. Um, at the Connecticut Green Bank, I ran the residential financing programs, both single family and multifamily, and um, then also took on all the low to moderate income kind of portfolio for the Connecticut Green Bank. So really happy to be here. Hi, I'm Lori Fielder, and I'm also very happy to be here. Thank you. And I am the V Green Program Director at VSCCU. Um, that stands for Vermont State Employees Credit Union. Um, so we're a credit union based in Vermont. Uh, we're also um, a values-based financial inf institution. We're not-for-profit, um, member-owned, and we have a niche in the energy financing market where we have um, developed loans over the years, a suite of loans called V Green, um, where the, um, they have discounted rates and extended terms, and they're designed to 
um, make maximum um, benefit out of energy improvement projects and purchases. Um, so we um, that's uh, that pretty much serves the residential uh, consumer market. We also do some commercial lending in the space, and um, we have developed partnerships over the years with stakeholders and vendors. Um, and the and Efficiency Vermont, who's our um, state uh, energy efficiency utility. Um, so we partner with them and others to provide um, low uh, low interest financing, um, and we have some you know uh, work that we've done on underwriting um, to also uh, align with um, some of the credit enhancements that those programs offer. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate the introductions there. Um, and I'm, clearly we have a lot of great uh, expertise here uh, for our discussion today. So I think to kind of kick things off here, I really wanted to, to really, I, I think there's really a, a good way to start this discussion here. And I think the discussion around the topic of, of low to moderate income, energy efficiency financing really kind of needs to start with thinking through the, the barriers to entry in that market before we can really start talking about some of the solutions and thinking through how to get the programs there. Because, um, yeah, you, you can't really offer the right solutions if you don't really know what the, what the issues are, and, and there are certainly going to be some, some barriers. So LMI customers, they do face a number of unique barriers that make it more difficult for them to access, you know, the, the money needed for to, you know, purchase energy efficient products and upgrades. So from, from your perspectives, um, where, where are you kind of seeing the barriers to financing low to moderate income efficiency upgrades? So I can uh, take this uh, to start and, and we'll see if Carrie and Lori have additional thoughts. I'm sure they will have plenty. Um, I mean, the number one thing we see, so we, we deal with building owners who are typically not the, the tenants, right? So there's, there's the typical principal agent problems you have around uh, owner incentives and tenant incentives. Um, and, and those can be exacerbated in, in LMI communities, um, especially when these aren't necessarily large portfolio owners. It's someone who may own a building or two buildings that they inherited. Um, they're part of the community. They don't necessarily have a lot of free cash flow. They're not making investment decisions like an institution or a large portfolio owner might. Um, and so, you know, th that's kind of the, the entering problem. But then there's also the problem around uh, cash flows being pretty much the, the main driver of any decision. And so one of the things that, that we have to make sure of is that um, you know, the, the numbers just have to pencil in terms of cash flow. It doesn't mean that uh, an investment necessarily needs to pay for itself right away. Um, but the more that it can do that, the better it, it, uh, it will uh, perform over time. And then also um, one of the things, too, that we have a lot of trouble with uh, in terms of our discussions are uh, th these building owners typically don't look at avoided cost in their cash flow assessments. And so um, when we're financing a project or doing a project, um, we have to be careful about what we wrap into the project um, or how we communicate uh, the project cost to someone. So if a project cost is you know, 30% energy efficiency upgrades and 60% you know, pre-weatherization and other upgrades for the building that just need to be done, um, we need to make sure that people understand, hey, you know, we're financing this whole thing because we want to do the, uh, the complete amount of work for the building. Um, but you know, we're, we shouldn't try to necessarily make the numbers pencil on, you know, a new roof uh, when we're doing an energy efficiency finance project. I, I could offer up a few other barriers that, that we've seen, because um, I, I agree with Glenn, you, you hit on some really important ones there. Um, we also see for, especially for low income consumers and moderate income as well, this concern like, am I going to be able to qualify, you know, because Typically, the financial system has not done right by low-income consumers, um, and we've got a history of redlining in our country and systemic racism when it comes to our financial system. So I think we need to recognize that as we're designing solutions. So, you know, if, um, if you're working with a mission-oriented lender, like a credit union who has that mission um, to serve customers, uh, you know, in, in 
and communities that haven't been well served, that's a great solution. Or if you have, um, you know, an approach to underwriting that doesn't require a credit check, that's another a great approach. Um, so I think, just, but just recognizing these are real issues in our low income uh, communities, and and we need to, you know, design solutions that will address those. Um, the other thing I think we need to understand when we're talking about uh, lower income, um, you know, customers is they're under a lot of stress and energy upgrades are hard. They take work, you know, they're in your building, they're, they're complicated. And so how are we making it easy for these sorts of customers to take advantage of this? Um, you know, is it a contractor they trust? Um, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? Those sorts of things I think are really important. Yeah, I mean, those are all, you know, everything Carrie and Gwen have said, those are our barriers that we see as well. And most of the work that we're doing is in the, the residential um, space. It's in the consumer space. So um, it's not so much the multifamily buildings. Um, and, you know, what we see also as barriers are, are you know, um, you know, just that debt to income ratio, you know, like we, we do have to do credit checks because we're a credit union. So that's part of our structure as a financial institution. Um, but we, we really utilize what's called storybook lending, you know, where we're not just looking at a credit score. We're not just looking at a debt to income ratio. Um, really, you know, in terms of barriers, it's being um, the barrier, the danger really is, you know, just really utilizing some strict, um, you know, uh, formula to, to review somebody um, who's applying for financing to fix, usually they come to us because they have a problem. You know, they have a leaking roof or a wet basement. Um, they have a failing heating system. Um, so that's one of the barriers. Um, you know, we're, we're utilizing some interesting um, ideas like, you know, we're using the offset of the energy savings um, to help with that debt to income ratio if needed. Um, and the other barrier is that they come to us thinking that they might need to just switch out their oil furnace or their propane space heater. Um, you know, in Vermont, you know, we have, I guess it's sort of specific to Vermont, but a lot of people heat with cordwood. Um, so they're like, oh, I just want to, I just need to replace this one piece of equipment. They don't have um, necessarily the resources to maybe research that there might be, um, you know, it's, they can maybe participate in the energy transformation and electrifying their um, their space, you know, like doing um, perhaps, a um, you know, a ductless heat pump would be a good option for them. But they they really aren't in the space. Like Carrie said, they're so stressed. They're just thinking of replacing exactly what they have. They're not thinking, oh, well, maybe there is an opportunity for me to, to really do something different. And instead of using cordwood, which is dirty and difficult and a pain, quite honestly, um, maybe I can consider, you know, putting in a heat pump. So just education and, and resources and information that's really accessible and meets them where they're at. Um, in, in, in that maybe stress space of trying to figure out how to put food on the table or how to pay for their car um, and to get to the job that they need to pay their bills. So um, just understanding that the energy savings might be something that you can underwrite and that um, information and resources that are really available would be helpful. You know, one yeah, thing I, that, I definitely well, agree with you there, and and I'm really kind of hearing from all of you, you know, several several threads that are kind of standing out to me, and I think I want to touch on those, you know, one by one over the course of our discussion here. But I, but I think the first thing I really want us to maybe focus on for this next part of our conversation is really thinking about how, you know, between the three of you, it sounds like you know a common thread that I'm noticing here between you know talking about the debt to income ratio talking about you know qualify is that whether it's fair or not there seems to be you know this in, this perception of increased risk by investors when trying to invest in low to moderate income communities so my question to you is is really how do you how do you de-risk these investments you know in in LMI communities to make them more enticing to investors you know can is there any sort of standardization of of either products or, or or financing programs that can really play a role here. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, 
on be, because we work in a lot of different sectors with a lot of different um, products. You know, I think it's uh, taking each sector and thinking about the ways in which you de risk for, for that investor. Um, if it's the single family space, there, there are a number of ways that you might think about de risking. First, you know, you want to be sure good quality work is being done and the right type of work. So, you know, being very, very intentional about the qualifications of the contractors and, you know, are you managing in them and overseeing them and making sure good, you know, they're licensed properly, have insurance and they're putting in good quality equipment. That too, like is the equipment that you're putting in, you're really going to um, generate the sort of savings that you're looking for or whatever the outcome is, because um, it's not, you know, there are resiliency plays as well. Um, and then, you know, having a standardized approach to how you underwrite and what the terms are for the product and are there consumer protections built in, these things all contribute to good loan performance repayment of loans. And that's what investors want, right? They want to know that their investment is going to be pre, um, uh, repaid. So while all of these may feel like program sort of things, they're so critically important to that story to the investor to get them comfortable. Um, standardization and, and scale is huge also um, because that, that makes it you know, easier for um, investors to think about underwriting risks. They're not underwriting risks like every single time they've got to get familiar with how to think about the risk. Um, but to the extent that you're standardizing approach for different spaces, that works really well. Um, the other thing for, you know, when it's not like a direct loan, but you're talking about a credit facility to, um, you know, open up a new type of lending like Block Power is doing with their facility um, uh, to, for heat pump leasing. One of the things we do is to be able to attract in other investors we can take the lower subordinate slice of a capital stack because we're extremely comfortable with the risk profile. We're really knowledgeable about the capital stack and the performance. And that allows um, us to attract in other investors who come in senior to us and that gives them some experience. Um, they get more comfortable with this type of lending. And maybe the next time they don't need someone subordinate to them. May, may take some time for them to get comfortable there. Uh, and, but you have to do this kind of across technologies and across structures and what have you. Um, um, but it can be done. Yeah, I agree. I think those are all, that's all. It's so interesting, Carrie, hearing you talk about it because for the credit union, I mean, it is an interesting space to have gotten into for a Vermont, a little Vermont credit union, right, for state employees. And now anybody who lives or works in Vermont or is a member of NESI, Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, can join. But at the time, you know, getting into a space like um, energy efficiency financing, we started small. You know, we just did these um, I remember when I first started in 2013, I believe our, our top limit on, a, on an unsecured energy improvement loan was $10,000. Um, and it took, you know, experience and seeing those deals and understanding who the contractors were and um, getting familiar with the space and the stakeholders and the other, um, the people who make policy, you know, in the state and beyond, you know, federal policy too. But as you get more familiar, they seem you're able to standardize. You're able to then centralize the underwriting. And, you know, it's like, this is how you underwrite these. Okay, well, we have standard practice, policy, procedure. Um, so standardizing that. And over the years, you know, now our top amount that will lend on an unsecured um, energy improvement loan is 60000 yeah. And that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot of money. But that'll pay for a big... Um, you know, energy improvement project, you know, uh, maybe a net zero project or big solar and battery project or something. So it does take that time for an investor or a lender to sort of gain the experience and realize 
that these loans are, they perform really well. We have very and low default rates. So on that, Lori, too, and for others listening in the audience, I mean, good news, sitting here in 2021, you don't need to take the years and years and years of experience. There are lenders in Vermont, the state of Connecticut, the state of Michigan, the state of Colorado. We now have deep um, you know, loan performance data. In fact, Lawrence Berkeley Labs um, has a research report coming out on the energy efficiency performance of four state programs. They've already done one on solar loans. Um, and so there's this kind of deep expertise and, and um, data out there. And one of the things we've done in partnership with Connecticut Green Bank and Michigan Saves is we've taken this credit union standardized loan product approach and we now work with states and, and cities and lenders all across the country to bring, you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. We've got the model, we know the model, it works. We've got all kinds of tools and resources for you. And what's exciting about that is we can now teach local lenders all across the country to kind of come in on this type of lending without having to go through the 10 years of experience that Laura, you and your shop went through. Mm -hmm. So you can go right to you know a standard. We, we don't start with 45, uh, we don't start with 60. We start with like 45 is the max. So you don't need years and years of experience to get there. We have the data. So I, I think, you know, that's just one of many examples of that standardization. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that we see. So, you know, we rely on our lending power partners like like IPC um, for the bulk of our, um, you know, the, the the money that we use in our leases. Um, so, what's really important to Block Power when we when we underwrite or when we review uh, projects is that it's not just the risk profile, but it's the it's the energy burden and the environmental justice piece that we care about. So. Just because someone can pay back a loan doesn't mean we necessarily want to, to to lend it because we don't want to increase the energy burden significantly. So we always do look at cash flows; those are really important to us, and the ability um, not just for a borrower to pay back, but but what burden we're putting on that borrower when we um, when we do the lease. Um, the other thing that's really important for us is you know we offer very long term leases, so twelve to fifteen year leases. Um, and, and so having a, an interest rate that makes sense over that long period uh, of amortization really is really important. And something that Carrie mentioned is that if we went to a traditional lender, um, you know, we might be looking at, you know, 12 to 15 percent if we could even get um, a loan for the type of projects we're doing. Whereas, you know, with lenders we're working with, you know, something like four to eight percent is is um, is what we're looking at. And again, like. That, that may not make a big difference for a, a three-year loan, but it makes a huge difference for a 15-year one. Um, so it's really important that, you know, obviously it's working with, with mission-driven lenders like IPC, but also being able to take the experience that, that they have and then going to, to corporate green bond issuers um, or traditional finance in institutions um, has been really important for, for Block Power. Great. That's really good to hear, guys. And, and I, But I want to change tax a little bit here because I want to go back to something that you mentioned, Lori, um, you know, you're mentioning about the cordwood heaters and how when the when you get folks that come and need to switch out, you know, their furnace or their space heater, they mentioned that they don't really have the re the resources to research, to do the to, to think through what are their what are their actual options if they have the opportunity to make a change here. And so, you know, it, it really seems like education and outreach seems to be especially important to reach these customers that may not have the support systems in place to take it, take advantage of, of, of understanding what their energy efficient options are and the, and the ways they can finance those. So, so for the three of you, what have you kind of found to be successful strategies you know, to educate you know, potential customers in, you know, in these communities? Yeah, well, for, for, for BSECU, I mean, we're a lender, so we we are very clear about what our role is and our expertise. And um, you know, knowing that we certainly have more expertise in in our um, community in Vermont um, to to help with that outreach and education piece, um, we really turn to partners for this. And um, so we um, we work with. Uh, you know, Efficiency Vermont, again, that's our, our energy efficiency utility. Um, the Department of Public Service honestly has some really great resources. Um, and we have, you know, the the vendors in, and the contractors, um, there many of them are part of what's called the EEN or the Energy Excellence Network. 
um, that's managed by Efficiency Vermont. So like Carrie said, having those trusted contractors um, be available for questions, um, particularly you know, when a lender is hearing from um, the borrower or the potential borrower that they have an inquiry along these lines, we do have these resources to connect them to. And, and so then once they've gotten that um, connection and they've had some of their questions answered, it might be a week or two, but then you see them come back to the credit union to apply for their loan um, because they've gotten their project kind of figured out. And yes, I was just gonna replace my propane heater or my wood stove to begin with. And, and now that I've talked to Efficiency Vermont, I'm actually gonna have an energy audit done um, and then, um, you know, I might even qualify for the low income weatherization program, which would be free. They don't know loan from us. We're happy to connect them to that. And then they might end up adding, um, you know, changing out to, to a different kind of more efficient or clean energy type of heating system. So, you know, really for us, it's those partner connections. Um, we also have a partnership where um, it sort of helps to de-risk some of these as well where Efficiency Vermont with the Home Energy Loan Program, um, we have credit enhancements, including a loan loss reserve and, um, and an interest rate buy down for qualifying um, households. So household incomes of less than 90,000 can get an interest rate as low as 0% for the five year term. So um, certainly those partnerships where we are not only getting the credit enhancement and we've been doing this for many years. So it's something we can scale up with new pro, you know, new programs. If, if they're like, oh, we want to do a heat pump program. There's one in the Northeast Kingdom in Northern Vermont that's going to be starting up. No problem. We'll work with those five counties, four counties, and we'll set up a special program from them. For them, no, it's not any big deal to us because we already have the program. We just replicate it. And um, you know, anybody in those regions are going to be able to qualify. Um, so so we've really kind of learned how um, how to use those partnerships and not be afraid to 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 leverage their um, you know understanding and expertise and um, you know it's really formed some great connections between the organizations as well. Yeah, and, and I think that it's not just the consumer education because that's a a very important part, but it's the complexity of these projects. I mean, these are not insignificant construction projects. Um, you know, we've done houses of worship uh, with attached residences or schools that are, you know, upwards of a million dollars for a project, right? So the, the only way to, to do a project like this is to work with the, you know, six to 12 different stakeholders, um, whether that be HVAC contractor, electrical contractor, um, a general contractor that you may pay a premium for, and uh, those folks might not have the experience or, or knowledge about incentive programs or energy efficiency. Um, you'll, you'll need an engineer to make sure that your sizing of equipment is correct. Um, you'll need to know what the equipment purchase cycles are and what the lead times are for that. So even if there is customer demand and they want to do that, uh, this type of project, and there's financing for it, it's very, very daunting. I mean, you know, most of us have done home renovations, which are, are relatively straightforward compared to some of the more complex energy efficiency project and electrification projects we're talking about. So um, there's a lot of, of, of fear and confusion. And so Block Power's whole business model is around trying to um, have a one-stop shop for building owners to go to. And so, you know, this is a, maybe a little bit self-serving, but, but working with a company that tries to simplify things um, and try to, to give the owner a single resource. Um, you know, in the military, it was, the phrase we used was a single belly button to poke um, on, on these issues, I think is really important. Um, and so it's, it, education is part of it, but then uh, having a resource throughout the entire construction process for these uh, sometimes very complex projects. And then also uh, having that partner understand the incentives and, and not leave money on the table because every dollar in these projects count. So if there is, uh, you know, weatherization money to access or or you know, lie heap money to access, like don't don't leave that money out as you're looking at the project uh, economics. The the only other things I would lift up from the great you know um, uh, ideas or, or you know comments from Lori and Glenn um, would be 
You've also got nonprofits and municipalities running outreach campaigns, so they're embedded in the communities that we're trying to reach. So um, I think it's a it's like a two way street. The financing folks need to make you know be aware of and plug themselves into these sorts of local campaigns. The local campaigns also you know need to be thinking about who the you know, right financing partners are, um, so that you're not only focused on educating on the technology, but like all the all the resources to pay for it, including incentives and financing. Um, and you know we Solarize has been amazing at doing this right but on efficiency it's not quite as glamorous so we got to figure that out right is it thermalize or heat smart i mean there's all in the northeast there's all kinds of innovation going on on the ground around that sponsored by municipalities and nonprofits and what have you and utilities and and i think we just need more and more of that but let's make sure that financing is plugged in whether it's a local lender like lori or um you know uh, one-stop shop providers like block power or what have you so, so let's build on that actually for a minute here and kind of dig into this a little bit further because it sounds like, you know, from, you know, what Glenn has mentioned and, and Carrie and you and Lori have mentioned, you know, it's really one of the key strategies here. And this is one that our members, the state energy offices have really found to be useful is, is, is getting the right partnerships in place. And, and whether that's with, you know, other state agencies or with the private sector or with nonprofits, you know, Having developing those partnerships with other entities have been kind of the key to unlocking some of these new efficiency financing opportunities for a number of different sectors and including including the low to moderate income communities. So, you know, from your perspective, when have you when and how have you found that you know partnerships are needed to kind of bring financing to these communities? I mean, I, I can start giving a couple of examples in Connecticut. Um, you know, the, the Connecticut Green Bank exists within the ecosystem of, you know, the state energy office and the utilities. And so you've got some built in partnerships there. There's a policy framework um, which exists there. But then, you know, bringing both the financing lender network and the contractor networks and working with partners like Sustainable CT, which has, you know, a, a growing number of municipalities who are part of kind of this certification program around sustainability and one of the ways that they can get points is by running sorts of campaigns and you know having the Connecticut Green Bank programs plugged in um, and it could be on the commercial side or the multifamily side or the single family side um, and so you know one one way to do it is from kind of the energy office out and then another way to do it is as Loria said kind of lender you know, kind of from the lender into the energy world. Um, but however it goes, you've got to you've got to marry those things together. I do think for government actors, the question always is one of procurement. You know, so how do you do that in a way that's fair? Are you running an RFI, an RFP? Are you selecting one? Are you selecting many? And I and I would just encourage folks on the government side to be um, to be really thoughtful about how do you design you know programs that are going to scale. Um, you know, programs that look good on paper but don't actually accomplish anything. That's not what you know. There's urgency there, right? So we need to act with urgency and all do haste and take lessons learned. So I think looking around and getting smart about you know what are things that that have worked um, would would make a lot of sense. And you know, a, a green bank like Connecticut Green Bank, being a quasi public agency has more freedom than than a you know department in the state government um, and that allows it to be a little bit more innovative and nimble um, right wrong or indifferent i'm like no judgment it just is what it is right that comes with the territory um but but that um allows for more innovation which is fantastic yeah and i, I want to double down on carrie's point about scale and it's really really important to think about that as you think about program design and um, and what pieces of the programs will scale well and which won't, um, and and what what will your program look like if it's wildly successful? Um, so, what what I mean by that is that you know a lot of times um, governments are used to making sure that there's a very you know transparent RFP process and that a lot of traditional stakeholders or traditional vendors uh, are are participating and that you know the 
there's maybe not a, a single a single winner of a program and it's kind of spread out. But the challenge with that is that that pushes the management and the program uh, management up to the government or to a contractor that the government hires to manage the program. And so what happens is as the program scales, like it just becomes more expensive to manage. And, and you could either do that by increasing the government staff assigned to it, which is really hard uh, because you know government hiring is, is really challenging sometimes and, and is not quick. Um, or it, it increases the program costs um, of, you know, if it's a, if it's a, you know, an ICF or something that manages the program, like that, that cost of that program management will grow. Whereas if you align incentives by, you know, maybe narrowing the field of, of vendors chosen um, and pushing some of that program management down to the vendor. So basically, as their business grows or scales, um, you know, their profits hopefully increase and they can wrap some of that program management into their bid. Uh, to us, that looks like a more scalable project. So, um, you know, basically taking a little bit maybe out of, out of budget designed strictly for program oversight um, and putting a, more of that into performance um, and letting letting the performance pay for itself as the program grows. And it also allows businesses to be more nimble and to, um, to invest in the business as a market grows or markets expand. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Glenn. I mean, we've had, in the experience that we've had, uh, scaling up to manage some of the partnerships and programs that we've been um, that you know we've been part of RFP processes and um, so forth, and uh, you know over the years there's been times where m more lenders were you know the the government entity wanted there to be more variety of lenders and not just BSECU, um, so they 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 really pushed for that, added you know tried to add some, and the reality is that those lenders weren't ready for that. Uh, type of work, so they didn't have the infrastructure or the, you know, computer systems or the software set up, or they didn't have internal expertise, and they started and then they couldn't quite get it going, and and, you know, quite honestly, that actually seems to be you know detrimental to scaling. It's just almost the opposite of what what really happens in reality, um, and so I really feel as though uh, that market approach of let the market sort of help here, um, or let the market sort of drive that growth. Um, and you know, we we do that with some of the vendors and the partners that we work with that are the contractors. You know, the energy efficiency contractors, the BPI certified contractors. I mean, you know, there there might be a hundred of them or two hundred of them in the EEN, but consistently we see about twenty of them, um, and it's because they have done more investments in their business to, to scale up. So, so in terms of, you know, how much energy is put into that process of getting, um, of having there be more variety of partnerships or, or vendors or participating lenders or, or contractors, there is a fine balance. I mean, you do want to spread out that knowledge and get them um, so that they're doing that work too. But you also, you know, these programs, don't have unlimited funds. And, you know, the other thing that we find is that we don't want to manage a program that has, you know, 10 other lenders in it and we only get two loans a month. It's just not worth our time and our, our trouble to, to up, you know, to bring that up to scale here at the credit union and, you know, maybe add personnel and increase our workforce, which is very challenging right now um, to manage a program that, maybe two years ago had 30 loans a month and now it has two loans a month. Um, so then it makes it so we don't want to do that program. So there are challenges with this, with this topic. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get some more comments from, you know, the audience on this. I, and I just, and I just want to pick up on that. You know, you guys both touched on this, um, the right partnerships and the right partners are key. And so everybody has to understand, you know, like what, what's the role you're playing and what's, what's in it for, for you. So as a lender, Lori, what you said resonates so deeply mm -hmm. with our experience in Connecticut and other States working with local lenders. Sometimes our government partners are like, okay, we need 20 lenders. It's like, well, wait, you need enough lenders to cover your region. And there's a 
there's got to be enough business there for the participating <laughs> lenders to make to make it worth their while. As you said, there's a lot of cost on the lender side, investor side to participate. So being realistic about like how big that volume is and, and what's going to make it worthwhile for you as a lender, also for a community group to get involved. You know, is it enough? Is it going to really align with their mission? So I, th I think that's what it comes down to, really understanding in partnerships what, what are the motivations of each of the partners? Are their goals being met? And are the goals aligned? Because if the goals aren't aligned, not a good partnership. Yeah, and to, to piggyback on that, I mean, a lot of these, you know, big swing efforts of trying to do energy efficiency at scale in markets, if there is a local partner in that market, they're going to be part of it, regardless of whether they're the ones chosen by the municipality or the utility. There just isn't enough, uh, skilled resources and skilled labor in a market to not utilize all partners that are competent and capable in a market. And so while you may choose a lead or two leads for a program for, for whatever reason, um, making sure that the other in-market partners are engaged, that you're convening those different parties to make sure that whoever you choose as the lead is aware of all the parties that maybe were interested in the RFP or, or working with um, throughout the project. Like, that's the only way you'll get to the hundreds or thousands of buildings that you're trying to electrify. Um, you know, there's not, and there, there's obviously always a battle between vendors to be the lead on a project because there's typically a little bit more revenue, it's more glamorous. Um, but the only, the only way it works is if, if all parties in a market are involved, otherwise you're not going to get to scale. Great. So I want to shift the conversation a little bit here. Um, we've got a lot of questions from our audience and I want to make sure we have the time to answer a couple of them here. So I think what well, this is a good way to kind of add some additional framing to this conversation. So I think, you know, in some ways, um, there's a little bit of a, the carrot versus the stick thing here with any sort of policy, you know, policy position as well as thinking through you know, some of the financing thing. And so would just in your opinions, would you feel like consistent building energy performance standards for existing buildings in the Northeast would help scale up private sector investment in home and building decarbonization and climate resiliency? You know, how important is this? Building standards would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it would yeah. make our lives so all our lives so much easier. That was a softball. Yeah, and also the stick is important too. I mean, local law ninety seven this in New York is driving a lot a lot of work um, because it's it's hard to make the case for avoided costs when you're talking about, you know, a boiler replacement three years down the road. It's easy to make the case for avoided costs when you're talking about a fine that's coming in three years or two years, right? And so the, obviously the carrots matter, um, but the sticks matter also where that's politically uh, acceptable. Um, but on the carrot side, making the carrots actually consumable is really, really important. And so when you have incentive programs, making those incentive programs transparent and not you know, changing every two months or three months and making um, some of the incentives you know, not necessarily tied to very sophisticated engineering um, is important. So you know, obviously um, you know, the government has to be a good steward of the taxpayer money, um, but if you make incentive programs so complicated that, that people can't use them, um, they're, they're basically worthless. Great. And I think another question here that actually makes a lot of sense is, especially given that we're, you know, kind of hope, you know, hopefully event going to be eventually started coming out of this COVID-19 wave um, that we're in, is thinking about, you know, the theme of public health and non-energy benefits that also can be addressed through energy efficiency retrofits. And, um, you know, have any of you ever kind of thought about maybe working with non-energy focused credit unions or financing mechanisms like in the public health sphere, since there's certainly a focus, you know, especially with indoor air quality these days, there's a lot of folks that are thinking about indoor air quality. So are you, have you, have you thought about, you know, kind of working with that and partnering there? What, what are your thoughts on that? Glenn should go first because you guys just had this really cool thing yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's a huge focus for us. And, and actually, sometimes indoor air quality is the lead sale. Um, and so in the D.C. area, uh, one of our partners, um, IAF, basically goes around with gas detection and, and is looking for gas leaks. Um, so they're not necessarily selling energy efficiency. They're selling, hey, like you, you have a gas leak. It's, it's, it's unhealthy. Here's the, the air quality in your building. Um, and, you know, as, as Carrie alluded to, partnering with Acclima um, to basically uh, 
look at overall air quality um, sometimes is the the lead into the sale and obviously the numbers have to work for everything um, but air quality is really important and then the other thing too what we've seen uh, more recently and we haven't actually done work here yet but what we're, we're getting closer to doing it is you know partnering with um, you know public health and, and, and health care providers to be able to finance energy efficiency projects that also have a public health impact uh, to do some of the pre-weatherization like lead and asbestos removal in addition to the indoor air quality and so uh, this gets kind of along the you know stacking of incentives and stacking of financing and making sure that we're bringing all the money to bear to a problem so if there's weatherization you know it's not just a weatherization contractor if it's indoor air quality it's not just a environmental um, abatement uh, or or, or, or um, or indoor air quality contractor. It's, we're trying to do all the projects at the same time. That way we can leverage all the incentives to buy down the cost of the project uh, to, the, to the end user. And, and that's something that we, um, in, in Connecticut, we've had a multi-agency project that, um, that, that actually got derailed by COVID a little bit because everybody, you know, the public health folks have been so focused on the public health emergency, of course. Um, but there's, you know, great models with green and healthy homes and, you know, other providers out there who um, have figured out how to unlock Medicaid and other health system dollars that go in as part of a capital stack. So, you know, as, as we know in the energy world, there are a lot of things that ratepayer dollars can't be used for that are needed to do a whole home, green and healthy home retrofit. And so finding other sources to plug that gap that's missing um, to do everything that's needed, um, whether it's pest remediation, asbestos, lead, mold, you know, kind of you name it. And so these are really exciting models, um, but not just Medicaid to government, but hospital systems, health systems, where they're, you know, already investing in affordable housing and supportive services that are co-located it's not that much further to, you know, imagine a green and healthy home retrofit at the neighborhood or community scale that's going to address population health uh, metrics around asthma, you know, lead poisoning, you know, respiratory issues, even trips and falls with, with older Americans. So we're really, really, you know, excited about this, but you, you just have a handful so far across the country that are doing this. Um, but but these are exciting models that we all need to be paying attention to. Yeah, the credit union, we, we're, we're already, um, you know, when, when we set up the products that we're offering, the loan products, and, um, you know, we have sort of a matrix of what is eligible, um, we do already include health and safety measures, and we would be more than happy to partner with, um, you know, just what Carrie and Glenn were talking about, some of these agencies. And the, I know of the Green and Healthy Homes, that's something that there is some work being done up here in Vermont on at Efficiency Vermont. So, um, it, you know, that's the kind of thing where we could scale up a program that really was centered around that um, concept. We, we do, our, you know, I remember when we were first starting the, the home energy loan um, back in 2014, it's been quite some time now. And one of the pieces was vermiculite remediation, which is the asbestos. And, um, you know, really there was so much structure around, well, would we even finance that? Would we want to be responsible for financing? Um, you know, it's $10,000 to do it in a single family home. And we were like, why not? I yeah. mean, it should totally be part of the energy project. There's no, there won't be an energy project. There won't even be a blower door right. test if we don't do this. So we, very, from the very beginning, we've had health and safety measures, including ventilation, um, be part of um, part of our eligibility. And, and like I said, if we can, if there's folks out there that are really interested in partnering on piloting, you know, sort of a, what would it look like if we threw more incentives at this for, for homes that qualified? Um, yeah, that would be great. We would totally want to work with somebody on that. And just on that, Lori, as we take the Smarty program model, you know, out across the country and work with other lenders, similarly, like, yeah, th those health and safety measures, we now have included them as standalone measures. Like you can finance that on your own because we know the, the loan performance is so spectacular um, that 
when we feel really comfortable doing that. The, the, so that's great on the lending side. The issue is if you're a low income homeowner, it's going to be probably too expensive for you to finance that through a loan. And so for our low income folks, we, we need incentives at play. Um, and those, you know, we need a source for those incentives because coming out of the energy world, it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's hard to do that. Um, so I think that's the rub is like acknowledging, yeah, we can say we can, we can, we can finance it, but that's probably only going to be for our more affluent homeowners who are going to be. Able well, to- we we've done it though in the home energy loan program, so that's a zero percent. And oh, one of the you, things, right. well, but you have an incentive yeah, of buying it down, right? But we've also done done these um, in in um, partnership with um, Capstone Community Action, so the Community yeah. Action mm-hmm. programs in Vermont will right. send us um, somebody who sa- will they'll say, well, we could do this much of this project. What do you think about looking at them to see if, yeah. if you might be able to do a loan? And a lot of times we can. I mean, just because they're yeah. low income doesn't mean that they're not eligible for a loan. You know, I right. mean, right. it just, we have to look at the whole picture and make sure it's the right thing for them. Yeah, and I guess one of the things too worth reaffirming, and I know everyone on this call knows it, but, um, you know, just because, People are low income doesn't mean they don't want to actually pay back the loans, um, and that they and and so, you know, it's important that you don't put them in a position where they're. I, I think that's what I was getting at. The like yeah. deeply low income do no harm. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's like a market segmentation. Right, right. Um, you know, like where are you in the on the income spectrum right. where you can do no harm and you know to really serve that household. Right. All right. So. We've got about 10 minutes left here in our session. So I have a couple of questions here to kind of kind of wrap things all up and kind of hopefully get us thinking about, you know, everything we've said so far in the conversation. And I want to come back to something you said about, you know, 10 minutes ago earlier in the session, Carrie. And and this also came, it also kind of touches on a question we have here in our chat in our in in, in my chat box here is thinking through, you know, you have a successful pilot program that's worked really well for a low income community in your, you know, in your neighborhood, in your state, in your city. And so the question is, is, you know, how do you, how do you replicate the successful program? I know, you know, how do you scale these successful low to moderate efficiency programs up in a state or regionally or even nationally? I know you've done some work here on this. Would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I I think um, we all as an industry need to be thinking about, first of all, identifying what, what are successful models. And as we think about replication, we need to be thinking about building platforms platforms where, where you can get the sort of scale that you need to truly serve, you know, a state, a region, you know, a, a, a whole country. And um, so when we think about platforms, we're thinking about standardized, you know, kind of who are your partners on the ground, um, whether it's contractors or other outreach partners, and and is are there policies and procedures and protocols that you can easily replicate wherever you are? Um, standardized products, you know, the actual financing product itself needs standardization. That's that's not to say just one product, just like each market segment is going to have, uh, you know, one or two or three products. Maybe it's a loan, maybe it's a lease, uh, on bill tariff. There's you know, lots of different ways to think about um, the products. And then for us, you know, kind of sitting in the middle as an intermediary between, you know, partners on the ground and the investors, we have to be standardizing what it looks like to the investors so lots of capital can flow. Because if we don't do that, we are going to build demand and then we don't have standardized products and you've got to like go find, you know, lots and lots of different investors who are willing to do the brain damage to understand this one bespoke thing. That's not going to work. Um, so it's kind of, you know, thinking about all those things holistically. Um, so, so when we're involved in pilot programs, we're always thinking like we, we don't want to do a one off. We'll be involved in a pilot if we believe there's a way to kind of test out that standardization to the customer while we're testing out the standardization with the investor and all the kind of programmatic, you know, the things that you don't think, you know, impact financing, but actually do that we, you know, that Glenn and Lori have been talking about this whole, this whole time, those things also become standardized how you vet contractors, how you, or in the case of Block Power, the technology that they're using and the protocols that they're using to scope projects and what have you. Great, anybody, any other thoughts from anybody else? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, to, to Carrie's point too, as a as a consumer of of financial instruments, um, you know, I think that the the flexibility that our lenders have given us in um, evaluating our own projects and pushing those decisions down. I mean, we still have to go to them and, uh, you know, with, with packages of projects and, and, you know, explain what we're doing or if there's something that's maybe a little bit different um, than what's in the term sheet, you know, we, we have to go back to them. But basically allowing us to push the decision bit down to the contractor or to the developer, I think um, it helps a lot because um, one of the things that's really unlocked Block Power's growth, um, so when I first met Block Power, it was seven years ago when I was at DOE. Um, and, you know, we used to have to go sort of project by project and, you know, find equity for the project, whether that was through crowdfunding or through, um, through local nonprofits, um, as well as the building owners. And then once we found the equity, we had to then go find a, a lender. And so what that really meant is that we did a lot of sort of uh, low-hanging fruit projects, whether it was lighting, um, some weatherization, some insulation, uh, some solar, um, but being able to do these more complicated uh, full electrification projects has really just been unlocked recently by having a committed uh, lending facility behind us to allow us to do these more complicated leases to where we could go to a customer and in good faith say, you know, if you're willing to do this project, here are the incentives and here is the financing and here is the monthly payment. Um, that's really been what's unlocked the growth of block power over the last 12 months or so. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's making it much easier for us to have a conversation with customers and also allowing us to go to a much wider variety of customers um, with some faith that if we say we can do a project, we'll be able to do it. And, and so what's interesting about that is that, you know, from block power's perspective, they can be very customized based on customer needs but for their credit facilities that they're getting from investors, it's it's standardized, right? So even though it may feel messy over here, from the investor perspective, you know, you draw a box, you you agree on methodology and documentation and what have you, and um, and there's I'm sure there's more work we need to do on that, Glenn, to make it even easier yes. for you, um, because still it is new. But that's that's how you drive scale. Yeah, I mean, I, that's just so interesting because, you know, I remember when we were first working on the home energy um, loan with Efficiency Vermont, and it became clear when we were trying, you know, they had their basic program design, but one of the things that they didn't know is the lending side, you know, that piece of, well, how is it going to look in reality when somebody applies for one of these loans? You know, what's that going to be like? You know, what are your parameters? What is... What do you need from us? What are you going to provide us in terms of reporting? Um, and over the years, we have standardized that. And we've also, which is really important for lenders. I mean, lenders, for the most part, are pretty black and white. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, but having that ability to use the systems that we have um, and, the, and the tools that we have um, without investing a huge amount in outside like technology or, you know, other resources that we don't really have the capacity to add um, or to expand um, without really investment from somebody else. Um, we're trying to keep the, the rates as low as they can be. Our, our mission is to not have so much investment and money that we're spending on tools and technology and all this other stuff that's not related to helping the borrower. Um, it's just important to keep the cost down so that we um, can provide that low interest um, and access to, to the financing and also not be um, a big expensive burden for participating vendors and contractors, like not charging them a lot of money. Um, so really standardizing things, letting us use the tools we have, and then, and then you know, working in with those partnerships and just building relationships. Great, and it looks like we have about two minutes left. Um, I do, I guess I can kind of have really quickly have a wrap up for each of you so that we always, we always try and think of NASIO in terms of the lenses that our members, the energy offices need to look through when trying to drive financing. And while they don't have all the solutions to issues that arise when changes occur, either at the gubernatorial legislative agency level, they do have a lot of ability to develop plans and inform decisions, et cetera, um, on, and educate new leaders on the value their offices provide. So for each of you, really quickly, is there just one takeaway you'd like to share with our audience that make sure they lead with before we end? 
uh, I'll just say, because we do a lot of work with these folks, um, you know, get educated about the models out there. There, You probably don't need to reinvent the wheel at this point. Um, and, you know, be part of this growing community that's looking to standardize and invest in platforms and build out platforms. You're also amazing conveners. So, you know, engage with your green banks, CDFIs, credit unions, you know, your broader lender, you know, regional banks, because you need to educate them, but they also need to get, educate you. Um, so that, that would be my speed and urgency. Don't reinvent the wheel. Great. And make it easy. So, you know, th this is a thing that uh, um, Glenn alluded to this a little bit, you know, keeping um, program design um, and incentives and rebates and things that really make the projects accessible to all of these communities, you know, LMI or just non-traditional borrowers or um, people that are in a situation, you know, um, situations where uh, they, it's going to be hard for them to access financing. The harder you make the programs, the less uptake there's going to be. Um, so, get, building in that flexibility and the um, and the ability of the participants, you know, in the program design, to sort of make sometimes make educated guesses the best they can on, on some of it, so that we can um, move the the ball forward and um, you know keep um, you know innovating in this space. Yeah, I guess my my thing would be don't get stuck in an echo chamber. So obviously sharing best practices at conferences like this are really important. And meeting with other program designers and program managers is really important so you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, but you want to spend more time in your communities and making it easy for people to come to you. And so, you know, small contractors who may be looking at doing energy efficiency work, you know, they're, they're not necessarily out there every day looking uh, to change how they do business because any friction in a business process uh, takes time and money, uh, especially in a hot market where there's a lot of work already. Um, and so you may have to make a more concerted effort at, at being in the community, being trying to, to invite new partners into your world who may not necessarily have cared about energy efficiency before. Um, so, you know, get out in the world and, and try to sort of, you know, meet, meet people where they are. Great, and so we are just a minute over time here. So really quickly, I wanted to just say, thank you so much for everybody who joined us today. I hope you got a lot out of this session and thank you so much to our three great panelists. I really, really enjoyed this discussion. I thought it was great. Um, if you do have any uh, further questions, please reach out to the NEEP staff. They'd be happy to, to direct your questions to any of the speakers. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. Era, it's back to thank you. you. Thanks, Sam, and thanks, Carrie, Laurie, and Glenn. That was a terrific conversation. I appreciate the message of getting to scale by building platforms and partnerships and convening. That certainly resonates with our work. Hi, Carolyn. That was a great three days. Oh, it was a great three days. It all went by in a blink of an eye. I love the, uh, the, the phrase about making the carrots digestible. I think uh, in the spirit of not reinventing the wheel, we might, we might use that one in the future. That's true, and I love some good carrots. I was really struck by uh, a lot of the new things that I heard discussed in these sessions. I don't think I've heard terms like restorative justice and uh, broadband more and more, and of course, whack-a-mole. These are not topics that would have been included 25 years ago and maybe even five years ago in a NEEP summit. You've been involved in a lot of these. What did you think? What were you struck by? Yeah, I was struck by, I think, a lot of the, um, the same reoccurring themes, many of which you just mentioned, but I was also really glad to hear the theme of building energy codes, uh, which kind of uh, for the work that we do is always an undercurrent. So I was really happy to hear about building energy codes and of course some of the work with schools, which is always near and dear to my heart, but it was nice to also see some of those foundational um, policies and work and things that we've been doing for 25 years still resonates and that there's still of course a lot more work to be done. But I, I loved hearing about a lot of the new opportunities and, and new terminology that we heard, especially green hydrogen, which I have been, you know, just like, what is that? So that was really fun to, to hear the chew on this. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, you know, the fact that energy efficiency is still the fundamental theme, even in the green hydrogen section, right? Uh, Manuel mentioned that energy efficiency is is first and foremost, right? It's the most effective, equitable way to get to a decarbonized future. So it's yeah. great for us to hear that. Yeah, for sure. I'm actually curious what our attendees also, what their takeaways were um, and anything that maybe they're kind of carry forward with them um, throughout 
you know, as they plan for their work next year or just what they're thinking of. So feel free to chat in, let us know like what, what your takeaways are. I think Sam had that from the last session. It's something I've been thinking about. So feel free to chat in from the summit, maybe one little kernel of something you learned or something you're going to take away, or maybe something that just was an aha moment that you had. So feel free to chat that into us. Yep. And uh, while you're doing that, we're not going to keep you. We are, we are at the end of the summit sessions. I will just note that uh, we hope you'll join us for Meets Heating Electrification Workshop, which is next month, October 27th and 28th, where we will focus on heating electrification and the great strides in our region on uh, cold climate heat pumps and other technologies, as well as the work that's left to do. And I will say one last thank you to our sponsors. You've heard about them throughout the sessions. Uh, they made it possible to have this this year. Um, drop your ideas in. Uh, we, we really hope, you know, first of all, thank you on behalf of me for your engagement. And uh, we're going to be saving all of these chats because we will be plumbing them for ideas for next year. We sure will. So I'm going to raise my coffee cup because I'm still drinking coffee. I know, Era, you're in California. You're also you're just diving into coffee. We want to say cheers to 25 years. Uh, and thank you for all of your continued par partnerships. And I want to say, you know, here's to the next 25 years. And we are so optimistic that we will see you in person next year for NEAP's 20, uh, 26th year in our summit. So stay tuned for more details on that. But we're looking forward to seeing you all in person next year. Definitely. I, without these, hopefully. So <laughs> yes. have a wonderful week and thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you soon. Bye. Spilling my confession.